Let's go. Okay. Let's go. All right. All right, all right. Do the thing. I don't think I should. Nah. I don't get what you said. Nobody. Be sure a real. <laughs> if you will find fire, you will know. Hello, Twitch. Hello, stream. Five. Hello, five viewers. Welcome to stream. I was planning on starting off much earlier than that, but I had uh, I, for, unfortunately many things happened that I couldn't make it. Sorry about that. I'm trying to have a um, Europe versus America schedule because this is France right now here. Uh, it's it's 20 to 8 a.m. and I'm starting to I'm 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 wanting to start at 5 a.m. here. So that I can make uh, 10 p.m. in America, that would be great. Uh, so Monday, mon Monday evening would be 10 p.m. Europe, and f uh, Thursday morning for me would be 10 p.m. Wednesday for America. So that would be ideal. All right, let's get started. So what do we want to do today? Today, uh, oh, first of all. I, I figured out uh, how to record OpenGL applications. So yeah, you'll be able to see what I build. Now, next time was shady because I couldn't actually show anything. But here, look at this. Oh shit, it's a box. It's the box that we did. So for now, now it works. It's working. We have our thing going on. Pretty cool. Alright. Alright, so what we want to do today is um, take this 3D geometry and magically make it into a 4D geometry cube type deal so that we can display it using wonders and magic and mathematics mostly. Okay, if you hear anything outside that's out of my reach, so bear with me. <laughs> Alright. Let's go. So, uh, in order to make 4D geometry based on that, I will use, I'm gonna write a little class function. Um, we will use, we're gonna, we're gonna write a, a stem geometry class. This is gonna, that's gonna hold our, our, um, 4D, 4D, uh, geometry. So basically we're gonna have vertices, of course. As an area, as a, yeah, well, this is not the um, uh, definitive code, of course. So we're gonna have we're not gonna be too hard on ourselves. And we're just gonna have a couple, a couple, even if it's very bare bones. We're just gonna have a couple variables, no biggie. Um, what we're we gonna need? Not much. We don't need much. Ah, let's decide. So vertices first, and then. We're gonna have cells, so I bet uh, all the 3D guys among you are familiar with what faces are. Well, it's that's finished. It's over. <laughs> no more. No more. What remain? What remains? Sorry, is called uh, cells. So what are cells? Cells are the 3D equivalent, the 4G equivalent of faces. Basically, in 3D you have something called. Um, Something called faces, which is most of the time triangles for usability reasons. And uh, what we have here is something called cells, which are tetrahedra, as I've talked about before. In case you didn't know, tetrahedra are pretty cool because in 4D they are the equivalent of triangles in the way that they are very easy to manipulate. So, what you're gonna have is we're gonna have a geometry. 4D actually, I'm gonna rename that file. Uh, in Hacks, you need to have just uh, much like in Java, you need to have the name of the class match the name of the file. It's pretty unnecessary if you ask me, but yeah, I'm not a language designer, so I'll take it. Yeah, alright. <coughs> so, what we're gonna write is 
uh, actually a function that will take a 3D geometry and do something called an extrusion to it. So in case you do not know what an extrusion, uh, uh, I do not know what an extrusion, extrusion maybe. No, no, no. In case you don't know what an extrusion is, it's basically uh, taking a geometry and shifting it alongside the direction. So what I ha what I'm doing here is I have V3D will be the 3D array of vertices. Faces will be of course tri the triangles as uh, offsets into this array. And Dooth, <laughs> Dooth is the term that we came up with uh, when we were working on the 4D prototype for school. And basically, we were hey, we kind of need, um, we kind of need um, a name for the 4D length because we have width, we have depth, with a, we have width, height, and depth, but we don't have a 4D thing. So we're gonna use a name that we're gonna make up. And we went for Duth because it was like the DU for duration and the TH was like width, height, depth. Most of them have it, so we just used it here. Alright, so what is extrusion gonna what is our this extrusion gonna look like? So basically this is just a matter of adding uh, for V in V three D. Oops. It's just a matter of adding or floating points, not floating. Oh yeah, it's an array of floats. Never mind then. So gonna be K. We'll go from zero to v three d dot length over four. No three, I mean. Why three? Well, that is because we are gonna use. We're gonna add uh, the v three d. Every float in the v three d array represents basically a three vector. Like, like so. Here you can see that it's a plain array of floats, but we have to use them as 4D objects. Well, as 3D objects, I mean. Here this is a 3D vector, this is a 3D vector, blah, 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 blah. extra, extra. Whoops. <coughs> so what we're gonna do is add those. Add those? Yes, add those indeed. Wow, incredible. So we're gonna add those to our vertices array, but we're gonna interleave an extra 4D coordinate because we are doing 4D for those in the back that haven't been listening. <laughs> so yes, we want in the at the end of the day we want to be able to build a 4D geometry based on any 3D geometry that we give it by extruding it in the quote unquote fourth direction. Uh, as I said uh, last Monday, by direction I mean dimension, right? When you think of dim extra dimensional spaces, you have to think of extra directions to go in. So because of that, uh, extruding around, uh, extruding along a fourth dimension is strictly equivalent to finding a fourth extra direction that is per uh, perpendicular. I mean, to all of the threes. So well, it's easily done by having four D vectors. Basically, if you have your dot, you like good old run of the mill dot product. And you, it just it just so happens that using a fourth coordinate with like zero 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 one, this vector here is perpendicular to any other vector. So feels good, man. Okay, so what we do is add simply v thirty uh, key times three. Point. I go replicate that shit. Is it enough? Oops. Is it enough? Still fuck it up. Alright, and what we are gonna do now is also add a new coordinate. It's basically gonna be dooth over 2. Well, I like to go from back to front, so we're gonna add minus dooth over 2. We're gonna add that instead. Okay, so that's the first round, and then we have a second round of that. And the second round of that is exactly the same, except we had, we add plus dooth over 2. Am I doing that correctly? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> so basically, what you're gonna do is add those for your vertices, and then from the triangles, basically extrude them in, um, extrude them uh, like we do here. Like you, when you have a triangle that is based, that is built with those vertices, it becomes a prism that is built with uh, this one and this one. Basically, what we're doing is I'm gonna whip out. I'm gonna whip out 
good old MS Paint here, like we like to do. We like to do this here in case you know. Paint, hello. This is Paint. Okay. So what we're doing here, here is, I'm going to do a three, two D to three D analogy, of course. So what we're doing here is we have a triangle. So imagine that this is a three D space, right? So we just we have a triangle. It sits in a plane, and what we're doing is basically we have this coordinate system here. Wink, wink. This is x, as you know. Here, this is y, and this is gonna be w, not not z. This is w here. Wink. All right. So what we do if is we have this triangle, and then we want to make a prism out of it. So simply enough, right? What we do is extrude it according to W. So I'm gonna just bear with me as I this is X, wink, this is Y, and this is W. So then you you might be wondering, but but Matt, but where is where is the Z axis? It's somewhere, alright? It's in the fourth dimension, you can't see it. <laughs> and that is very accurate, it's not a joke. It is in the fourth dimension. But because we see 3D, I'm basically only quote unquote focusing on the important axis here, the one that matters to what I'm saying. So what we're gonna do is follow along the y, the W dimension, and have extrude this, uh, extrude the vertices basically. Is what I'm doing here. You can see in the code. Uh, you can see in the code, but now you can. You can see in the code that basically I'm taking the same x, y, z coordinates and adding an extra w coordinates that goes uh, inwards and outwards by half the amount I want it to be, basically, like this. So all that does is, not exactly this, but more something like that. Like, it goes forward and then it goes backwards. Like this. And so that makes a prism that has the same base area as the triangle we first had and has the height that we gave it, like we called it doof in our code, in our code. So yeah, because just like that, this makes a prism. And what's good about prisms is that you can very easily, oops, you can very easily uh, cut them into tetrahedras if you tried. <laughs> and oh, we're gonna try. We are gonna try. Okay, so that's doing. Yeah, I fucked it up. <laughs> or did I? No, no, I didn't fuck it up. It's fine. It's just weird because of the projection. Ugh. This is our prism. Prism! Yeah! So this prism here, we're gonna do it much better than that. Don't worry. Bam. Alright, so we're gonna, I'm gonna do another prism. So this prism here, we can easily, uh, cut into Actually, three tetrahedra, and as again, as I said, tetrahedra are pretty cool for us 4D programmers because they are the equivalent of faces, which are called cells. And cells you can think of as 3D faces because the the surface of a 3D object is actually just well 2D, right? But then the surface of a 4D object is 3D, so we are we need to have 3D volumes in order to describe 4D geometry, basically. And this will be done via, first of all, tetrahedra. But those tetrahedra, when we extrude from 3D geometry, we have a triangle, extrude from prism, extrude to a prism. But then we can cut into tetrahedra, like so. That one. This is one tetrahedra here. It links those vertices together basically, like so. That's one tetrahedra. Um, and then that's another one over here. Uh, which one's gonna be? It's kind of confusing when you think about it. Okay, it has to be this one, I believe. Over here. That's one also. And the last one is, well, Take the rest. Take take what I didn't take what I didn't select yet. Okay, so I actually already. Oh shit! I wasn't showing the. Fuck. What does nobody tell me? <laughs> okay, so yeah, tetrahedra here. Sorry about that. I didn't realize I wasn't showing the paint program. My bad. So as I said, prism, tetrahedra, bam, 
here and here. So that's one. Scratch that. Then we have that. This tetrahedra here. This gives okay, so this is what we want. Here. This was here on the left, and then on the right is another one. And then when you take both out, you are left with something like this. Here. This tetrahedra here on the other side is the third tetrahedra that we want. Okay, sorry about that. My bad. Alright, going back to this. So we have so what do I want to use? In which order do I want to push them, right? Do I want to have first all the 3D vertices with same with similar W coordinate or first or do I want to have them kind of like this? I don't remember. <laughs> I'm gonna cheat and look at past code that I wrote because I've I have done the tetrahedral decomposition before. It's already here. So I'm gonna cheat like a bitch, and I'm gonna see in uh, in what order this is done. Okay, original vectors first, and then extrude along the W. Sounds good. So this way is the oops. I meant this way. This way is the good way. Okay, good to know. And actually, I'm gonna just quickly do that. So I don't have to do it ten times. Just store that amount of vertices that we have. Boink. Hey, stop. Boink. All right. And the base is gonna be vertices dot length. Oops. Why do we need the base? Well, basically, we need the base oops, to determine uh, when building the tetrahedra, which which tetrahedra go uses. What vertices basically? I, I should I just fucking post this stream on Reddit. I don't care. People have told me, oh, I can't make the stream. Then you can because it's here and it's fucking America. <laughs> American 40 stream. Come hang out and build 40 boxes. There you go. Bam. In before Reddit takes down the link because I'm spamming it over three days. <laughs> oh, this link has already been submitted. You can submit it again. Can I? Is that a good thing to do? I will submit it again. I don't care. Let's go, mate. <laughs> I said do it. There we go. All right. So just just out of curiosity, has any of you guys been here before on this on the previous stream on Monday? So tell me in chat. Tell me how you feel <laughs> while I build those good old vertices. Well, so here. Oops. Oh yeah, again, this is gonna be annoying. All right. So this is gonna go over our faces array. Face number. Single letter variables represent. I'm I'm a I'm a junk using mathematics. Single letter variables all the way. What's good? <laughs> uh, yeah, over three because triangles, right? Faces is an array of triangles, of triangles, so we cut by three basically. Okay, that works. That's fair. Okay, so how do we do that? So, luckily enough, I have, because I'm a smarty pants, I already have deducted the code for, well, the code, the combinations of vertices that make up uh, tetrahedra, so here it is. This is what it is. A, C, E, D is the first, B, E, C, A, B, E, C, A is the second, and C, E, F, D is the third tetrahedra. Tetrahedra, sorry. And uh, this doesn't work, I don't believe, so that we're going to keep that for later. <laughs> and texturing, it's weird in four dimensions anyway, because you need 3D textures to, to, to bleed on 3D cells, and it's all wonky and weird and stuff, so I'm not going to do that just yet. So yeah, base is what I call here extra text offset. So we're going to use that. Okay, copy, copy like a bitch. Okay, so fn is minus 3. Alright, so var uh, face offset is 
f3 times 3 because we want triangles. We are using triangles, I mean. And now, copy paste, let's go. Bam! First of all, change that. Oops. Change that into base because that's how we called it. Bam! And then instead of face.a, face.a, we want uh, faces. Uh, face offset. Place all. Bam! And then face.b, faces plus one. Bam! And then face.c, faces plus two. Could you believe? Oops, sorry. Would you believe? Bam! Alright. So this should work. If I didn't fuck it up. And then, what we do is push a couple things. Just a tad, you know? Just a couple. And we actually push 12 of them. Because our cells are gonna contain all the tetrahedra of our geometry. So, A. Well, I have to respect the order, right? A, C, E, D. Is that it? Yeah. A, C, E, D. Alright, so that's, that's our first tetrahedron. A, C, E, D. Congrats. Congrats, everybody. This is our first tetrahedron that we did. B, E, C, A. B, E, C, A. Alright. Second one. As again, uh, again, as I said, uh, prism. Is what we're doing here, and the prism is three tetrahedra. A prism, as you can see, has six vertices in 3D and 4D because it it's the same thing. You could you could embed 3D objects into 4D space. They exist. They just have a zero volume basically. Uh, so yeah, we have our three tetrahedra. C E F D is the last one. C E F D. All right, let's do a final check. A C E D. That's okay. B E B E C A. All right. C E F D. Okay, sounds good. And then that's it. We have our 4D geometry. Easy enough. So we can we, we can test that out uh, real quick. Uh, if I do in my box, I create my new geometry. What I'm gonna do is um. I don't know, well, first of all, we're gonna store that for later usage, of course. Ah, hey, okay. So we're gonna have a public var geometry, which is on geometry 40. Stop! Numpad! Okay. There. Doesn't take any arguments, because we're gonna build it later. Okay, and then, and then, and then, feel it. Feel that shit. <laughs> feel that shit. You can, you have to feel the 40. Okay, geometry dot from 3D as we call it. And then vertices faces. Uh, no wait, vertices yes, cube faces is how I call it. Is how I called it. Yeah, cube faces. And we're gonna give it a dooth of one because I'm original like that. Okay. 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 Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh. Right. Reddit is telling me shit. Sorry. Uh, stream, please. I want the stream flare on my post. Recent post. Very recent. Stream, there you go. That's fine. Alright. Okay, so yeah, geometry is from 3D. Vertices, cube faces. And what we're gonna do is trace our geometry. And in order to do that, we implement a two string function. Because hex is. Hax's standard way to do that is to return, to use two string to return string, right? Seems fair enough. And in order to do that, we're gonna dirtily, like a little bitch, return all the arrays. Just like that. Vertices is, well, vertices. And then, face, cells, sorry, is cells. Bam. Easy. Alright. We got trace on geometry just like that. All right. So what does it look like? So I know what I'm supposed to get in terms of vertices, much less in terms of tetrahedra, but that that's not important, is it? <laughs> All right. So we're gonna have a bunch of, of output. So the float has no field add. What did I do? Add. 
Oh yeah, add shit. <laughs> so it's not add, it's push. Boink. There we go. So the the OpenGL output doesn't matter because we're just gonna there you go. here. All right. So what we have here, vertices is we see all the vertices that we want, basically, and we have an extra minus 0.5. And then uh, at one point it's gonna turn into an extra 0.5, not minus, as we can see here, here at the end. So we just have to check that we have 16 of them. So in order to do that, I'm just gonna print good old uh, array count geometry oops, dot vertices dot length over three four I mean and then geometry dot vertices dot cells sorry dot length a dot length over th four again because the tetrahedra has four vertices all right so what I want is I'm supposed to get sixteen vertices. And I'm supposed to get how many tetrahedra? Can you all, for all the four people in chat right now, do some basic math in their head and tell me how many tetrahedra I'm supposed to get? I can give you a hint. The hint is that I have one prism per 3D triangle and that I have three, uh, 12 triangles in my 3D box. I'm gonna use my audience to do some basic math for me. Let's go. <laughs> Anybody at all? Question mark. Nope. <laughs> Guys are too good for that. All right. <laughs> so yeah, uh, our box, as I said, it has twelve triangles. Trust me on that. I would them. I would know. So twelve triangles when extruded make for 12 prisms and one prism makes for 3 tetrahedra so if everything goes right we want 36 tetrahedra out of that so let's see if we do and we do 16 vertices 36 tetrahedra sounds good all right i will trust my form my former self to what hang on why was the box red? Box of red for a moment. I do not remember. Oh yeah, I changed it. Fuck, I changed it in the stream. Sorry, sorry. Can I fix that here? I thought that I had implemented uh, the uniform color in my sleep. I didn't, sadly. <laughs> okay, so we have our 40 box. The geometry is what you have. Like so. Uh, geometry, geometry. Hello, geometry. Yes, here. All right. So we have that, and now we're gonna display it. And oh boy, <laughs> it's gonna be different. It's not gonna be what we're used to because right now we can't, we cannot just feed it to OpenGL. <coughs> Sorry, we have to intersect because remember that those tetrahedra they live in 40 space. They are not just your regular world run of the mill 3D tetrahedra. We are there actually 40. Yet they are made by made up by four vertices, just like in 3D, of course. But this is not this is not what we want at all. This what we want is 40 tetra 40 boxes displayed in 3D space because our brain Rooney over here can only process 3D 3D shit. And as such, we will have to do what is called hyperplane slicing. So I'm going to expand a bit on that before I dive into it. Paint, go! We bought the paint. Let's go. Paint streams, everybody. Paint streams. Okay. So what I mean by hyperplane slicing. So first of all, in case you all don't are unfamiliar with your linear algebra, a hyperplane is, if I live, oops, if I live in, oh, yo, stop. If I live in 3D space, which I do right now, if I live in 3D space, I have, as a, again, the good old uh, 3D coordinate system, like so. And this is going to be Z this time. Don't worry. Back to familiar grounds. Okay. And a hyperplane is any, any combination of two of those vertices, basically. A hyperplane is, in 3D, just a plane. It's a two-dimensional thing, so I could draw it, and I will. 
I'm crazy like that. Bam! Hyperplane. Oh shit! Mathematics! Science! There you go. Hyperplane. It's just a regular old plane, like you all know. But the real catch is that in 3D it's trivial. But in four dimensions, and any higher amount of dimensions that we want, you have W vector that doesn't look like anything, but I'm gonna draw it anyway, because I'm crazy like that. This is gonna be all W. W. Bam! W, here. So a hyperplane in here, because we are in four dimensions, a hyperplane is any combination of three vectors that form a 3D space. So I can't possibly draw it, but I'm gonna try anyway. So, well, you, you have one here. All of this, well, that's a 2D plane, but if you think of those vectors, Z and W, as pointing outwards, then you have your 3D space. This is your 3D hyperplane. The whole 3D space that contains me, you, you your favorite bar, everything, is a hyperplane of this 4D space. Basically, the idea is that in n-dimensional space, a hyperplane has n minus one dimensions, n minus one dimensions. There you go. So yeah, a hyperplane is exactly that. So why did I choose a hyperplane? Well, because we want three D. Uh, we want a three D scene out of a four D thing of a, of a four D scene. Sorry. So because we are in four D space, our hyperplane is fortunately a uh, three dimensional. And that's pretty neat because this is a hyperplane that we human, we humans can live in. Ain't that good? So in order to do that, what I'm gonna have is I'm gonna do another class called Intersector. It's gonna do the slicing basically. If you didn't guess already, so Intersector.hx. And what it's gonna do is, if I have a 4D cube that I'm gonna draw as a cube for now, because we take things easy as to not lose everybody in chat and on stream Moink. ugly cube but that'll, that'll do the <laughs> living residues S stop residues stop please here cube bam so we're gonna take it one dimension uh, down and instead we're gonna render a 3d cube as if we were good old arcade mario on his 2d plane so if we were good old Ark and Mario on his 2D plane, we would only see 2D things. And as such, we would have no way of understanding what a cube like this is. Because it's 3D and we live in 2D. We don't know. We only know like the X and Z axis. Z axis, basically. We only know that. So, poor us. <laughs> Oops. I'm going to draw our plane of existence. Here. We only exist on this plane. Can you stop with the residues, please? Thank you. Yeah, we only exist on this plane. Like so. This is our plane. We live in it. We can draw ourselves. It's gonna look a little bit like this. Yay! This is us. And we have to experience this cube somehow. So a very obvious way to do that would be to just project it like we project 3D on a screen. And then it would look like basically just a square. <coughs> but that's boring. That's shitty. We're not going to do that. Well, we could do 4D like that, but in my opinion, it's boring. Because flattening geometry is always less exciting than actually cutting into it. <laughs> also much easier, so pff, where's the, where is the challenge, right? So yeah, what we do instead is take this plane that we live in and extend it so that we cut the 3D geometry. And this goes actually behind it. I'm gonna do quality perspective if I can. I hey paint please. Okay. Goes behind it like that. Bam. And goes around. Bam. And it cuts through it basically. I could just yeah. It cuts through it like that. And if you take the intersection, you are left with what is effectively a 2D slice of a 3D object. And we are gonna draw that like so. Like so, I say. Can I do a polyline? Yes, I can. Oh boy. Feel solid color. And the result is this. Bam. 
There you go. So this is the result. This is what we see. A square. Exactly like if we flattened the square, the, the cube, into the, onto the plane, like I said. However, this is, only, this is the only case where this is correct. Because if the cube rotates, the, the cut is going to do weird shit. So let's do the weird shit in question to illustrate what I mean. So we're going to draw a cube that has, that is much less um, axis aligned, if you will. And instead, we're gonna, not even like that, we're gonna draw it, uh, vertex first. The vertex first is gonna look like this. Okay, I have to actually picture it in my head. Alright. Stop. Vertex first. And it's, this is not, uh, isometric projection. If you know what that is, it's not bad. But it's just a way to have a weird looking cube, sort of. How would that look? I don't know. Ah, that'll have to do. <laughs> that'll have to do. And it will. You better believe. Alright, and I'm not gonna... Can I go through the trouble of... Sorta. Of. Right. I will... I'll do the all, all the faces. There. Ugh. That's ugly. <laughs> Alright. A paint artist for hire contact me in, in, in correct message. <laughs> paint artist for hire. I can do any cube you want. Alright, so if our good old little plane over here extends to intersect that, it's gonna be much more of a shit fest. Because then, what happens is we have a weird cross section that looks like the Pentagon. Here. So, like that, like that. And it cuts over here. Like so. Bam, bam. Bam, bam, bam. It's actually a hexagon. So if I'm gonna um, take that out and draw it properly, it looks like. Oops. Hey, stop that! <laughs> All right. So like this, it gets the front, uh, the front thing right here. It stops around here, over here, and then cuts here and here. So it does a little straight edge like that. Then goes back to here and back to here. All right. So this is the cross section of our cube. So, unless I told you, and unless you saw the process, there was no way, as a 2D Mario in his 2D plane, there was, there was no way you would have been able to know that this is actually the cross-section of a cube. However, what you would have been able to know, to tell, right, is if the, cu the cube rotated, then the slice would have rotated in unpredictable ways. But, because you are a 3D being, you can pretty much tell from the, the slice that this is a cube because you know what a cube looks like because you know they exist. Also, I just realized that's not at all what a cube look like, looks like. I forgot an edge. <laughs> Quality streams, but, but that's fine. Alright, so what you're going to do is the exact same thing from, 3D, from 4D to 3D. We're going to just take our good old uh, tetrahedra and slice them uh, in 3D. So I have al again, I have already all the necessary code for that, which I'm gonna reuse with no shame whatsoever. Bam! So it's gonna, you know. So the idea is that we have UX, UI, UZ, UZ, and a normal vector. So the intersector basically is, uh, as I said here, a helper class to calculate the intersection between a 3D hyperplane and a tetrahedron lying in 4D space. So what that means is, we have our tetrahedron, as we do since the very beginning. It looks like four vertices. If you weren't aware, uh, a, ver a tetrahedron has the same property of the triangle, that you don't need the edges or the faces, you only need the vertices. So if you have four vertices, V1, V2, V3, V4, it's, it is enough to tell you, to, to uniquely describe a tetrahedron. Just like for a triangle, you don't need to store anything like uh, the slope of the edges or the winding order or anything. You just need the vertices. And in 4D, same thing. Uh, in 4D, four vertices uniquely describe a tetrahedron. In 3D too, actually. So it doesn't, yeah. So because of that, what we're gonna have is also what's called a 3D basis. Basically, exactly what you would think, right? It's just the X, Y, and Z axis, and Z axis, in your intersector. 
Remember, an intersector is a 3D space. It's the 3D space that we are going to use to cut through our 4D geometry. And of course, the intersection between a 3D space and anything can at most be a 3D space. It could be 2D if you, for example, the intersection between a triangle and a 3D space and the triangle is inside the 3D space, then the result is just the triangle, it's 2D, right? So this is actually also a linear algebra thing. I'm not gonna I'm gonna write real quick. Bam. So linear algebra. Well it's topology actually, but you get the drill. You get the drill. So basically intersection between uh, n dim objects and a p dim object, dim is dimensional, right? Is at most uh, the minimum of the two. Basically, it's at most minimum of n p dimensional. So if I have a three D space and a four D tetrahedron, then the object, the resulting object, is at most four D three dimensional. So that's what we want. Also, I found that up. I can't English. Intersection between an dimensional object and p dimensional object is the most. Oh no, I can English. Okay. <laughs> we are still pulling through. It's fine. Remember that it is 8 a.m. here. I'm doing my best. <laughs> yeah, so because of that, this is very useful for us because then we know for a fact that intersecting uh, our intersector over here, terminal, go away. Intersecting, uh, using our intersector over here with anything 4D is going to be 3D at most because it could be less again as we are going to see anyway what we are using here is again x-axis, y-axis, z-axis and a normal vector because as many of you know a plane in 3D space can be described by its normal vector it's no different in 4D space, it's no different in 8D space, it's no different in any dimensional space it to, in order to describe a plane, all you need is a normal vector. And because we are doing affine geometry and not just linear, we also need an origin. In that case, in, in, the, in the context of my uh, or prototype type deal for the engine, it was object. The anchor was an object. But we're going to use a good old vector 4 instead here. We're going to use nothing, actually. It's going to be always centered. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so what we have is a basis. What we do is use this function, intersect tetra. It, it takes a tetrahedron as, of, uh, as four points, as an argument, and returns an array of vector four, which basically are all the points of intersection of the 3D space with a tetrahedron. So, good thing to know is a tetrahedron is called convex. Uh, is a convex object. What is convex? Convex means that at no point between two vertices, between two, two edges, I mean, is any angle over 180 degrees. So, paint, please, do your best, do your deeds. So, a convex object. So, basically, this is convex. This rectangle that I draw, that I drew, is convex. Uh, what else is new? This is convex. Because you could say, but Matt, there's no angle. But there is another definition of convex. The point of being convex is that if you take two random points, like here and here, the line that joins them is entirely contained within the, the object. So that's how you know something is convex, basically. I want to learn graphics programming, but I only went to CAC 1 in college. It was like four years ago. Oh boy! <laughs> oh boy, you are in trouble. If you want to learn graphics programming, you're going to have to brush up on your linear algebra, like I'm doing, so you are in luck, my dude. Syrup monster. That's disgusting. <laughs> anyway, yeah, a thing, an object is called convex if, when you take two random points, like three and here, you can draw a line between them, and every point on the line is within the object. So this is convex, as you can see, because if you take those two points, or those two points, or those ones, those ones, those ones, always the line itself is always within the object. An example of a non-convex uh, shape would be this one. This good old arrow here. Why is this not convex? Because, well, 
consider this. This line has both endpoints inside the shape. However, every point on the line is not in the shape. So because of that, the object is not convex. So that's easy like that. And a property of, well, in 2D, you could say, to start with 2D, you see very easily that oops, a triangle is convex, right? Easy enough, no biggie. Because then, whatever two points you take, the line is always inside. Pretty good. You go, oh, but it's not inside. Yeah, but this point is not in it. Read the definition. God damn it. <laughs> so yeah, a triangle is cool like that. And, actually, as I said, a tetrahedron is nothing more than a 3D triangle, so of course a tetrahedron is also convex. You're going to have to trust me and my projection on that. So here, our tetrahedron is always convex. If you take 3D lines, oops, not that one. If you take 3D lines with two, both endpoints inside the tetrahedron, it's always going to be inside. So that's pretty cool. How do we use that in our intersector, you ask? If you don't ask, I am sad. No, <laughs> I'm fine if you don't ask. If you don't ask, this is a very important property, because a 3D space also, believe it or not, is convex. In fact, this is a linear, linear algebra theorem, theorem again. Basically, what the theorem says is, in finite dimension, in finite dimensional space, a hyperplane is closed. Uh, convex, I mean. Closed is something else. It's also closed, but that's something else. So yeah, a hyperplane is convex. Uh, somebody correct me when I say it doesn't always hold in finite dim in infinite dimension. I was thinking about doing a quick refreshing on can, then going over extensively three calculus here. Yeah, that would be your best bet, I think. Uh, calculus can be very brutal for 3D rendering if you are very much wanting to know about all the theory because you have things like the rendering equation uh, which are like a bunch of surface integrals that you're gonna have a hard time dealing with as everybody does but yeah uh, I support that decision do it dude you have the power in you but yeah if you're gonna do that then you're gonna be in luck because I use linear algebra extensively so as I said uh, tetrahedron Convex, hyperplane, convex, and actually theorem of linear algebra again. <laughs> I'm gonna not gonna write it because it's pretty straightforward. But the intersection of two convex sets is a convex set. So a tetrahedron is a convex set. A 3D a hyperplane, any dimension, is a convex set. So the intersection between both must be convex. And that's pretty cool because uh, it allowed me on white paper to work out that. The intersection of a tetrahedron and a 3D space can only be one of three things. Well, it could be one of five things, but two of them never appear, because they are edge cases. So, uh, one thing can be absolutely nothing. It could be just nothing. If the You can think of the tetrahedron as a triangle, and you can think of the hyperplane as a plane. So, easily, what that means is, the triangle could just be above the plane. Just like that. And then the plane doesn't intersect the triangle at all. And the 3D space doesn't intersect the tetrahedron at all. So what this so this is one case where the intersection is just nothing. It's this case here. R is empty if basically S1, S2, S3, S4 are the signs of the vertices of the tetrahedron applied to the Cartesian Cartesian equation to, of the plane, which is just that. So if you remember uh, in in the high school, when you prob I don't know about you guys in America, but here in here in France, in high school we saw Cartesian equation of a line. So it's just that basically a line is defined by A B C as A X. Oops. A line defined by A B C is just all the X Y so that X A X plus B Y plus C equals zero. Equation of a line in a plane, right? 2D plane. There's only x and y, no z, no z. So this is a line. This is called the Cartesian equation of a line. And uh, the way this works is because a, b, and c, well not c, but a and b, 
are the components of the normal vector to the line. Oops, normal vector to the line. Again, if you if you were here on Monday, uh, I did a little talk about normal vectors, and basically I'm going to do a quick refresher on that. Uh, the point is that in n-dimensional space, uh, no vector, normal vectors are orthogonal to n minus one ob dimensional objects. Basically, this is what that is. In uh, in order to understand that a little bit better, I'm going to do a squeaky little case. In two dimensions, we have our white plane here. Two dimensions, bam! This is a n minus one dimensional object because here n dimensional space n equals two. In two dimensional space, normal vectors are orthogonal to one dimensional objects. This line here is one dimensional. You can only go on it in one direction. Uh, one direction both ways. Again, don't get that confused. So the orthogonal of this, easily enough, is the one perpendicular line that goes through it. Bam! Perpendicular shit. Oh, dude. All right. So this normal vector. This is our normal vector, and it's normal to this line here. So this normal vector has uh, coordinates because it's a two D vector. You could call it IAB here. AB normal vector AB. So you could define the line as every point that is orthogonal to as every vector. Sorry, that is orthogonal to AB. Pretty straightforward, right? So how that works is. If you take the dot product, so if you have, for example, like any point x, y here, this is our point, and we're gonna give it coordinates x, y, like so. So we want to know if x, y is on the line. So what we do is we assume that the center of intersection is the origin. I'm gonna write that real quick. Uh, where? <laughs> where do I write it? Here. So the origin has coordinates 0, 0. Of course, and the center of intersection will be the origin. It will have coordinates zero zero. So, in order to know if our point x y is on the line, we only need to know if our if the vector that goes from the origin to x y is perpendicular to a b. That's very really straightforward. If you if you start at zero zero and go to any point on the line, you will very much quickly see that it's actually perpendicular to a b. So. This is done using something called dot products, that I'm sure many of you know. So basically this is x, y, dot, a, b equals zero. The, the a property of the dot product is that it defines orthogonal vectors as having dot product zero. So dot product is just ax plus by equals zero. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Well, yeah, it's the equation of our line. It's just the special case where the line goes through the origin. If it doesn't, then we have to make sure that there is at least one point. We know that the, the, the origin is inside the line. So if this suddenly stops being the origin, like instead of 0, 0, it's uh, 01, 02 coordinates. Well, OX, OY, right? So this is not the origin anymore, but this is a point with coordinates OX, OY. Any coordinate doesn't have to, we don't have to know them. So this this changes our equation, right? Because then you can just use the origin as well an origin. <laughs> you can't use the origin of the system as the system as the origin to the line. Instead, what you do is you have your uh, radical equation, I believe it's called. So x y scatter. Well, it's not x y anymore. It's x minus o x a minus uh, y minus o y. Uh, scatter our vector a b equals zero. So why is it o x o y? I don't. Uh, I mean, it's just the vector that goes from o x o y to x y. It has coordinates this. So if this is zero, then you unfold it. It becomes a x um, a x or oh, not a x a x minus o x plus b y minus o y equals zero. So you can actually reword, write that into ax plus, plus by uh, minus aox minus boy equals zero. 
And what you see is that this is actually equivalent to AX plus BY minus AB scalar OXY equals zero. Zero, I said. Right. So yeah, basically, all there is is that this extra C term, which is, yeah, again, plus C equals zero. This extra C term that we all know about is actually a dot product between the origin, between like any point in the line and the normal vector. Minus that, in fact. So yeah, this is pretty easy, right? Then you can have the, 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 the Cartesian equation for any, uh, hyperplane. Because that's what it is. The, this one dimensional line here, if you look, I, at the, at the text I removed, so you can't look at it, but <laughs> if I do it again, n dim space has n minus 1 dim hyperplanes. There you go. Just like that. If you look at here and then at here, you will see that in n dimensional space, normal vectors are orthogonal to n minus 1 dimensional objects. That means that in n dimensional space, all you need to define a hyperplane is a normal vector. And then you inst n an origin point, but if we go, if you make it go through the origin, then it's fine. But if you only have normal vector, this is enough to write this Cartesian equation. And if your hyperplane goes through the origin, then c equals zero, so it's extra easy. Is everybody okay so far? <laughs> is there anything I need to clarify? Is there any, are there any questions? Now is the time. <laughs> I was told that people are uh, not familiar with linear algebra in any way. Or like f not since a long time. So if you are lost, now is the time to catch up. I am, I'm giving you this opportunity. Grab it, <laughs> grab it with your bare hands. And also excuse the French accent. I'm doing my best. It's kind of hard. American streams. <laughs> All right. So if you are good, we just carry on. So yeah, we have this equation, and uh, this equation describes, as I've just said, a hyperplane. So let's get out of 2D. 2D is boring. 2D has been done and done and done again. Uh, we want to keep that, and we want to keep that. So we're going to get rid of this, get out, get rid of this, get out. All right, so you I could go on and on about how it's the same thing in 3D, when in 3D you just use an actual plane instead. And have that, bam, bam, and bam, and plane you're gonna go off on the side because I can draw here. Yeah. Right. So this is the same thing. A 2D plane in 3D space, you can see that in three dimensional space, normal vectors are orthogonal to two dimensional objects. So this is a two dimensional object right here. Here's one. He's called plane. Hello. Chat, this is plane, plane, chat. And uh, what we're gonna do is uh, draw the normal vector, so everybody is fine, and everybody goes like, but math, this math is too easy, like, what the fuck, I went here to get my mind blown, but yes, but wait, this is, this is because you live in 3D, and 3D is easy for you. Normal vector, bam, not gonna expand, this is called N, shit, this is not what I wanted, this is called N, it has coordinates, not in green, it has coordinates, N, X, N, Y, N, Z, and again, you can define a Cartesian equation by saying simply a n x plus well x times n x plus y times n y plus z z times n z plus d equals zero. And d is, as we've told, uh, n dot origin. We call that, we're gonna call it o, and d is minus that, in fact. So yeah, bam, normal vector hyperplane. Equations! Mm, mathematics! Mathematics, okay. That's enough. But then four dimensions. Well, there's no reason it would be any different. And in fact, it isn't. So, I'm gonna not draw a 3D space because it's here around you. This 3D space that you live in is uh, the hyperplane of a 4D space somewhere. Think about that for a hot minute. So yeah, your 3D space, it has a normal vector. Again, in, 
in 4D space, and the normal vector, as the name implies, is not contained in 3D space because it is in fact orthogonal to every vector in our 3D space. And we are vectors, right? We could be vectors if we define our center of mass, and if we define, for example, the chair in front of you to be the center of the universe, the zero 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 point, then you have you are a vector, and this vector that you are is orthogonal to the normal vector to the 3D space in 4D space, because that's how it works. The orthogonal vector is defined as the one vector that is orthogonal to everything in this orthogonal space. So this is what you have here. Uh, get gonna get rid of paint, I paint. This is what we have here. Fuck off, Matt. Get out of here. This is what we have, as I said. We define our 3D plane with a normal vector. And because we want to be able to express things in it, we also want a 3D basis, XYZ. So the hyperplane, the hyperplane function here, is literally just that. is the dot product between a vector V and the origin. Because again, um, as I've said just just now, uh, you could define the equation just like that: ax plus by plus cz plus dw because it's 4D plus e equals zero, and we've seen that e is just minus oops a normal vector dot product the origin. So in fact, all you can do is well, you can you can do it in such a way that it's n. Uh, dot product v your your um, your vector which has coordinates again x y z w v is x y z w and then yeah and n has coordinates a b c d just like that so yeah instead of doing uh, a x plus b y plus c z plus d w you could just write dot product between n and v. And then, if you do not know, the dot product is called a bilinear function. Bilinear, it means that it's linear on the left and on the right. So you can factorize and, and expand and things like that. So, the way you can factorize this is simply by saying that n dot product v minus n dot product o is just like a multiplication. Is n dot product v minus o. Easy like that. So yeah. So now you know that the coding trick, by the way, for anyone who's doing base changes and funny shit like that, this is uh, especially useful in shaders if you want to try and see if a point is on a line. A line in 2D space is a hyperplane, so you could just do it like that. So yeah, uh, we could just do that. So if we have a vector v and origin o, then this equation will be zero if and only if v is on the hyperplane. It will be positive if v is above the hyperplane will be negative if v is below the hyperplane this is something called um, intermediate, intermediate value theorem and we're not gonna go over it but we need to know we have to know that the sign of this formula tells us all about the position of v in regards to the hyperplane I'm gonna use it extensively in fact so yeah as you can see normal dot dot product v minus uh, origin just like we did here and it's just the Cartesian equation like here ax plus by plus cz plus dw plus e equals zero so how do I use that? well I was telling you before that if the tetrahedron is entirely above or um, below the plane the hyperplane then there is no no intersection and the result is just the empty array so this is how we try. This is how we test for that. So S1, S2, S3, S4 are going to be the sign of the hyperplane function. The Cartesian equation applied to all four vertices of tetrahedron. So if you remember just what I said one second ago, if hyperplane of V1 is zero, it means that, that V1 is inside the hyperplane. If hyperplane of V1 is positive, it means that V1 is above. And if hyperplane of V1 is negative, it means that V1 is below. So simply also remember that a tetrahedron is a convex set. It means that every point, every line in the tetrahedron, every line whose both ends are in the tetrahedron is also in the tetrahedron itself. So this is how we know that 
if the sign of every hyperplane equation, S1, S3, S2, S3, S4, if all of those have the same sign, then we know for sure that the hyperplane is not going to intersect the tetrahedron, because every line inside the tetrahedron will be contained between the four vertices, intuitively. So this means that the tetrahedron is on the same side. All the vertices of the tetrahedron are on the same side of the hyperplane, thus no intersection. This is translated with this. Basically, if S1, S2, S3, S4 have all the same sign, then if you add them all together and take the absolute value, it gives 4, always. So if this is the case, then return the empty array. This is much faster, but equivalent to testing if S1 equals S2 equals S3 equals S4. It's the same thing, but much faster, basically. Alright, second case. Uh, if one or more vertices are inside the hyperplane, the number alone determines the shape of the intersection. So this is basically uh, an observation that I made, that if at least one vertex of the hyperplane, of the tetrahedron, is inside the hyperplane, then the intersection will exactly be any other vertex that is in the hyperplane. I'm not sure why, but I just found out that it was true, right? Mathematics? So to, to illustrate this, we're going to, again, do the same thing in 2D, 3D in fact. I'm going to take uh, my intersector. My 3D intersector is in fact just a plane. It's a hyperplane in 3D, so it's just a plane. <laughs> if you are confused, raise your hand. Okay. And the, all right. And we will have a triangle in 3D space. So, like that. And it just so happens that there is at least one of the vertices of the triangle is inside the plane. And so if you look if you look carefully, you will see that in fact the intersection between the triangle and the 2D plane is this edge right here. Starts here, ends here. This is all the intersection that we have. This this edge here. So yeah, as soon as one vertex is inside the hyperplane, plane, the intersection will be uniquely defined by all the vertices that are inside the plane. Easy like that. So what I'm gonna do is one or more vertices inside the plane. Yeah. And you might say, but wait, but if I have a triangle that looks like this looks like this, it goes yeah, well it goes behind like that. And then it goes back above. Like so. I said like so. <laughs> okay. Then you might say, but wait, Matt. There is one vertex in the plane, but the intersection is not what is given by what you said. Instead, it's exactly this line right here. And yeah. In 2D, it works. In 3D, it, 2D doesn't work. In 3D, it works. If a tetrahedron... You, you're going to have to take my word on that, <laughs> basically. If a tetrahedron uh, in 3D in 4D space intersects a, um, a hyperplane in such a way that at least one of its vertices are inside, then just see which vertices are inside and push them, basically. Uh, so we do that. We do it. If uh, we push in R, what? Oh wait, why, why is that here? <laughs> Using arrays left and right. Okay. So yeah, that's what we do. Point there. If if at least one is in it, push everybody that's in it basically. V1, V2, V3, V4 doesn't matter. Just push it. Third case, the hard one. And you will see, you will notice that I do not return here because there are more vertices to be pushed. Third case, the hard one, where the intersect, we, where the intersection is a triangle or a quad. We intersect all edges with the hyperplane to find points. We know that the line causes hyperplane because we have tested it before. It, just for a quick reminder, if the, if and if no line intersected the hyperplane, we would have quitted here because uh, the, this would mean that tetrahedron was on the same, was on either above or behind, or below the plane, I mean. And we have, we would have returned here. So when we reach this point, we know that 
the tetrahedron is cut by the pain. So then it's kind of brute force. I didn't find a, clever, a more clever way to do it. So what we have is, I just, we have six possibilities, because, uh, because why not? <laughs> and the six possibilities basically are all the edges that can possibly be cut by the hardware plane. S1, S2, S1, S3, S1, S4, S2, S3, S2, S4, S3, S4. So those are all the pairs of edges that can be cut off of, sorry, not of edges, all the pairs of vertices that form edges that can be cut by the hyperplane. <clears throat> so the way this works is easy. If the sign of two vertices like that, if the sign of the function of the Cartesian equations applied to a vertex, if two signs are different, it means that one is on one side of the hyperplane and one is on the other side. So intuitively, you could you could you could easily think that it means that it's being cut by the hardware plane, of course. And then we have to make sure of one thing: is the sign can be zero if S1 is inside the hardware plane and S2 is above. Then and S1 and S2 will be different, but we do not need to push S1 again because we already pushed it here. Basically, is what that means. So we have to make sure that adding both is indeed zero. Because one has to be minus one, the other has to be one. Basically, is what that means. I'm not sure if doing it like that is faster than checking both possibilities. If S1 equals minus one and S2 equals one, or S1 equals one and S2 equals minus one. But it's shorter to write anyway, and I'm a lazy ass, so I'll take it. It works. No complaints. <laughs> is all I'm getting at. So yeah, if uh, two verge, two uh, edges, if uh, one edge, sorry, um, has its endpoints on both sides of the hyperplane, then line space intersect, just like that. So line space intersect. I just wrote it out on paper. You can do it if you want. The idea is that simply uh, a line could be written in a parametric way. So a line, we saw earlier that you could say it was ABC and AX plus BY plus CZ, uh, well no, plus C equals zero. That's one way to do a line. Another way to do a line is via parametric form, which is basically a line is also defined by a vector U, directional vector, and an origin, O. Oh. And in that case, it's every point of the form t times u plus o. Easy like that. Every point on the line L is every point you get when you evaluate this with any renumber t, basically. So u is called the directional vector and o is called the origin. So what you can do to compute the intersection between a line and a 3D space? Well, in the case of a line in 4D space, u will be 4-dimensional, well, u and o will be 4-dimensional, but that's no worry. It, be, it says, it tests the same equation, right? And a space, as I've said before, a, 4D, a 3D space is a hyperplane. So, space, well, h for hyperplane. It has a normal and an origin, uh, not the same one. Origin will be p, because, sure. And then, the hyperplane is every every point, every vector v, that's so that this is zero. Oops. Yeah, so every point so that this is zero. So to calculate the intersection between L and H, which in which in uh, which is either a single point or the line in itself, because remember, L is one dimensional, H is three dimensional. Our good old MS Paint over here reminds us that the intersection between an n-dimensional object and a p-dimensional object is at most minimum of n and p-dimensional. So in, in our case, what this is, is L is one-dimensional, H is three-dimensional. So the intersection between both is at most one-dimensional. So we know that we can only get either a line or a point. And in our special case, we know for a fact that the, li the line itself is not contained in the hyperplane because both endpoints are on both ways, are on both sides, I mean, of the hyperplane. 
on either side. So what this means is we know for a fact that we can only get a point out of this intersection. And the way we do it is basically we want to find all the points which are both on the hyperplane and on the line. So we know both. All the points of the hyperplane satisfy this. And all the points on the line have this form. So what we do is take v and use this form instead. So it becomes n dot t times u plus o minus p. Oops, minus p. P, I said, right, equals zero. So you can write it out. It's long and, and ugly and stupid. But, well, it's not stupid, but it's long and ugly. So what we do is simply let me do it on my spare time and have the result here. Easy like that. <laughs> so yeah, um, this is it. Again, we know that this only knows one solution. Because the line is not contained in the hyperplane. And we know that the, the intersection is either one-dimensional, which it cannot be, or zero-dimensional. And what is zero-dimensional? It's a single point. It's not two points. Two points is not a vector space. It doesn't have a dimension, properly speaking. But instead, it's a one, it's a zero-dimensional space. So it can be only one point. So you know, we know that there is only one such possible t that satisfies this equation. So we find it. It's uh, this. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Impressive, right? So yeah, t is easily found. And then you do, like, again, the same thing. U, u times t plus o. V1 is o. And yeah, it checks out. And the result is the one point of the line that lies inside the hyperplane. In other words, the result is the intersection between one of the tetrahedron's edge and the hyperplane. So that's exactly what we want. And when we do that for every edge, then we know that we got the final result. The final result in question is every point on the edges of the tetrahedron that lies within the 3D space. And when you link them, you link them together, you get either nothing, in the case where the tetrahedron is outside of the hyperplane, you get either nothing or uh, this case here that we're going to ignore because it's an edge case and not important. So you get either nothing or a triangle or a quad or a tetrahedron. In the case we, where the tetrahedron, because it's a 3D, it's a 3D object, it could lie within a 3D space. Again, good old MS Paint over here. Uh, welcome to everybody that just arrived. I saw the spectator count just bump up a little. Welcome. We do linear algebra for now, and we are going to move to 40 boxes soon enough. Um, yeah, because intersection between a three-dimensional object and a three-dimensional object is at most three-dimensional. So it can be three-dimensional. It's possible. In the case where the tetrahedron is inside the 3D space, the result is the tetrahedron itself. It's an intersection. Easy enough. Okay, so we are we have all we need to implement our 40 bugs. Wink. Also, by the way, spoilers. Uh, now that I have I have I have figured out how to record um, OpenGL windows, I will be able to tell you what we want to get at the end of the day, and that uh, exciting. So I, using my old 4D uh, application, I I plotted well plotted. I drew a couple OpenGL things, and in the form of rotating 4D boxes. It's a 4D box that rotates in a 4D way. Alright, I'm gonna use quickly here. There you go. Bam! 4D. So this this is two boxes. Two 4D boxes that are being subjected to a 4D rotation. And it may look like morphing to you, and it should. Because it does. The point of it is that it's a 4D box, so we can only look at it in a 3D way, using our intersection, like I said. So if you remember the example I gave uh, using the 3D cube and the 2D plane, if we were 2D Paper Mario looking at the 3D at the 3D cube through 2D slices, and the 3D cube was rotating, 
he would do pretty weird shit that we wouldn't be able to comprehend. And this is exactly what's going on. This 4D cube is, is doing extremely boring shit for a 4D person. But because we are 3D people, it looks crazy and weird and wow, what, look at this. But actually it's just rotating around its center. It's boring as all balls. But it looks like it's morphing because the cross section, the 3D cross section of it is not, not trivial to us. Not trivial to anybody really, but yeah, if you look around, you see that it in turn becomes either a, a sort of square shaped box, uh, which is a cube, I realize now, <laughs> becomes in turn a cube and then a box that's not quite a cube, but has a rectangular base instead. This is because in the same way that a box can look like a square or a rectangle, depending on the angle you look at it, this 4D, this 4D shape is not quite a cube, a hypercube, but it can look either like a cube or a rectangle shaped box, depending on the quote unquote 4D angle at which you look at it. So this is what we want at the end of the day. Kinda spoiled it, but I couldn't, I just couldn't help. Just couldn't help it. So yeah, this is the kind of 4D box that we want to have at the end of the day. It also has a little material lighting going on, which I'm not, which I'm pretty proud of. No, it's nothing. Alright, so this is what we want. Point. And we are gonna work toward, towards implementing that in a brand new, uh, in a brand new way, which is through OpenGL shaders, because this right now is done as as I showed you on the CPU with this intersection, Strahedra intersection. It's not too long, but it's this is executed basically three times per triangle in the initial 3D geometry that we use to extrude the 4D geometry. So it's being called a lot. And it's being called so much that I'm wondering if it wouldn't be hundred times better to use a geometry shader for that. So if anybody is familiar with OpenGL, um, if anybody isn't familiar with OpenGL in fact, the geometry shader is a special type of shader, like just like vertex shader, fragment shader, you, know, you name it. Geometry shader is a special type of shader that basically takes primitives as input, for example triangles or points or lines, and outputs other other primitives as output. It could be anything. It doesn't have to be the same primitive type. Which is why it's interesting, because OpenGL has this input primitive called lines adjacency. Oops, all caps. Last up, lines adjacency. That I'm not sure what it is, but the one interesting thing about it is that it's made of four vertices. And in OpenGL, uh, vertices, positional vertices in particular, are vec4. Vec4 is basically 40, ver 40 vectors. And then you may ask, but why would OpenGL, which is used for 3D, use 40 vectors? Because of something called homogeneous coordinates that we're not gonna go into because it doesn't apply to our case anyway. Um, but all the other thing you need to know is that uh, normal 3D vectors, good old, oops, run of the mill 3D vectors, are given an extra one coordinate. So instead of V, X, Y, Z, when it's processed through OpenGL, you get basically V, X, Y, Z, 1. Just like that. Uh, this is to make sure that every affine transformation, just like translation, rotation, scale, etc., is made linear. There is a, this is a linear algebra trick. It's not very interesting for us anyway. So what I'm hoping to do is take advantage of the fact that every positional vector is 4D, basically, in, in nature. And instead of just outputting 1 every time here, I'm just going to output my regular good old W coordinate that I have here. In my geometry 4D, those vertices, again, generated using this, as you can see, are four-dimensional. This is X, Y, Z, just like those. This X, Y, Z here, it's the same ones here, X, Y, Z. Uh, this W here is this one. So you can see it's regular good old 4D coordinates. And instead of, oops, phone going off, sorry about that. 
instead of outputting one every time, we just upload the actual W coordinate. And in fact, it's not gonna, it's not so much gonna be this one. Well, it, it is gonna be this one, yeah. The point is that the geometry shader uh, will take as an argument the so called line adjacency primitive, which in fact will be a tetrahedron. Because it's made of four, four D vectors. Easy enough. And the geometry shader, in turn, which I'm not sure why I wrote that way, but that's fine. Is gonna take as input as, as I said a tetrahedron, wink, and it's gonna output whatever it is the intersection between the tetrahedron and the hyperplane over here is given out to be. So we know that it's gonna output triangles. How many triangles? You ask. Anywhere between oops, anywhere between one to four. Why? Is it between 1 to 4? Because, as I've said before, the intersection between a tetrahedron and a hyperspace can only be either nothing, so in fact it's between 0 to 4, bit from 0 to 4, sorry, English. Yeah, so it could be either nothing, in which case it outputs 0 triangles. It can be uh, a single triangle, in which case it's 1. It can be a quad, in which case it's 2 triangles. And it could be the tetrahedron itself, when the tetrahedron lies in 3D space. In which case, a tetrahedron is 4 vertices. So yeah, that's how you know. It could be 1, 2, or 4 triangles. Which, it's pretty cool that we know it, because geometry shaders in OpenGL need to know <coughs> what is the maximum amount of vertices they are able to emit, to, to give, to give out, basically. So we know for a fact that it's going to be 12. So that's pretty cool. Max 12 vertices. There you go. So we... First, I want to use the CPU code. We're using this intersector over here. Uh, I want to use that to plot our 40 bucks. Using uh, exactly the same code that we did here, basically. But instead, on the render, every frame, yes, every single frame. We're gonna use the intersector code to first of all intersect the tet every tetrahedron in the geometry of the cube, the hypercube, which are gonna which is gonna give us a bunch of triangles. But the triangles are still four dimensional. We are gonna come back to that because we can it's not over yet. Oh no. Oh it's not over. We're gonna have to do much more linear algebra before we can actually display anything. Okay, so this can go. I'm gonna adapt my intersector code real quick, as to not be dependent on all the previous 4D engine math. So feel free, if now is the time to ask questions, now is the stupid debugging code adapting time. So if you have any question or any insight, I would need, if you need more insight into what's going on, I can go over that while I'm debugging, while I'm adapting this. So feel free. Feel the freest, in fact. F on a scale from North Korea to America free, feel America. <laughs> I'm just gonna wait a little bit to see if anybody has anything to say. So far they haven't, but you never know. Keep trying, you might just succeed. Yeah, if anybody needs a reminder on linear algebra also. If anybody has linear algebra homework, <laughs> if anybody has math homework they have to do, like fucking give it away. Um, I need something to do something else. <laughs> uh, while I do this, it's not so exciting. Just building. I'm gonna build a little vector four class real quick. That's one too many coordinates. XZW. So also everybody that was saying, oh. But mad, 4D is just three dimensions with parallel universe. I mean, yeah, it really is. So what? <laughs> You're saying because it's just parallel universes is not interesting all suddenly? I think it is. I think it's interesting. Also, fucking do the thing, will ya? Default value zero because I'm lazy ass and I don't want to say everything every time. 
Also, for anybody who's not familiar with what's going on, this is a language called Hacks. It's pretty cool. I like it. It's, uh, it lets you compile on multiple targets. Using this same code, I could make it work on C++ for Windows, Mac, Linux, Java for Android, Objective-C for iOS. I could compile it to Flash, all sort of things. HTML5, of course, all that. So yeah, it's pretty cool. I recommend you check it out. The website is axe.org. Over here, it does. Does it have a S? HTTPS? I don't. I don't remember. Bam. Just like that. Yep. Okay. So vector four is gonna hold just that. I'm gonna. What? Well, what am I doing? I'm just gonna use my good old vector four class that I already wrote. What am I doing? What? What is the thing that I'm doing currently at the moment? Copy paste that shit, yo. Yeah, could you guys imagine if I had to rewrite everything? Oh boy, how boring that would be. Oof. I'm glad I instantly know what I'm doing and talking about also. <laughs> Else we would have like fucking boring debugging sessions where I would just write stupid code. Okay, I'm not using anything else, I don't believe. So we could just use it like that. Really quick. Oh, I have Vector 3. Shit. Okay, I see how it is. <laughs> vector 3, here you go. It's slime. Well, I'll do. You'll do, I guess. Yeah. I guess you'll do. Oink. Suddenly, Vector 3. Okay. So, the point of those is component swizzling, just like uh, GLSL and Shadow Language, if you know of that. Basically, if you have Vector 4, of if you have any vector, for example, you have a vector 4, you can type this vector 4 uh, dot xyz and it will return the vector 3 that is made up of the xyz coordinates. So I wanted to replicate that because uh, I like it and I use it in a 4D cross product. I'm just checking that we don't need any other import. Vec4, 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 near equals. <laughs> That's about that. Forget about that. Normalize. Vec4, 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 and just check. Okay, sounds good. Intersector should be fine also. It uses only Vec4s. Oh yeah, this needs to go. So again, we are not using an origin. So, it, well, it's gonna be the origin, right? Uh, so we don't need that. We just need a basis. X, UX, UI, UZ. Uh, I'm gonna use the good old well, do I use the defines? Just, nah. One, 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 we get it. It's, it's like that, okay. The normal, oh yeah, um, as it turns out, you will have guessed that the three, the set of the 3D basis plus the normal vector makes for the entire 4D space. Of course. Because, uh, okay, quickie paint session, quickie paint sesh, paint streams. Uh, that needs to go. Point. So if we have a hyperplane, again, going back to that, real, really quick, won't be too long, I promise. Hyperplane, Shh, stop, residues. And not the complex analysis one. <laughs> Funny. Yeah, if we have a hyperplane, point, then you can build the basis of this hyperplane. What this means is, you can find two vectors, which I'm gonna call which I'm not gonna call, I'm gonna draw them instead. So yeah, just like that. Two vectors that are not uh, linearly dependent, which are linear independent, if you will. And basically, with those two vectors, you can make any vector in the plane. And if you take those two vectors and add a normal vector, then bam, you got a basis for your whole space. How's that? How good is that? What else is new? <laughs> also. So yeah, if you take those, you have uh, the whole space, which uh, is shown very, very, very obviously by the fact that here, one, 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 we've got all uh, orthonormal vectors of the 40 base, of the 40 space, I mean. So yeah, uh, switch base is uh, pretty cool, if you will. Switch base is a function that takes something that I call vector 4D that I'm going to use and copy, 
copy paste. And vector 40 basically is an alias for either a vector 3 or a vector 4. The point of this is that when you give it a vector 4G, it checks if it's a 3D vector or a 4D vector, and it switch to the other. The point is if you guys are familiar with uh, base change, base changes. Is that the word in English? Is that how you say it? Change of bases, I guess. The point is that a single vector in 4D space, granted that it belongs to the 3D plane, you could express it either using its 4D coordinates or using its 3D coordinates in the 3D bases of the 3D hyperplane. So, the, 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 this is a symbol dot product. So we can say that if it is a vector of 3, then you could express it as a vector of 4 by simply multiplying every coordinate with ux. It's basically x times ux plus y times ui plus z times uz. Because n, it suddenly turns your vector of 3 into a vector of 4. And this is what's going on. If you look at here, v is the vector. So v dot x times ux dot x, ux dot y, ux dot y, ux dot z, ux dot w. Is what's going on. I'm doing this instead of doing actually x times ux, ux plus y times ui, because doing that would instantiate four vector fours, and I'm not too keen on that. So instead I'm using a single vector four and unrolling all the math. It's pretty... Because we are, we switch base, we will be doing a lot in the regular pass. Because basically, when we do our intersection with tetrahedra here, uh, we are gonna switch base all of the intersection points, and that makes for a lot of calls to this function. And I would rather avoid instantiating four vectors <coughs> per call, and one, when well, one is already a lot. <laughs> Ideally, I would get a parameter like sort well. Destination of the 4D. Oops. Fuck. Okay, you get the point. But I well, I, it's this is a test, so it doesn't matter. It, we're not actively seeking performance. So yeah, if it's 3D, it means that it's expressed in the 3D basis. So we do a 4D with it. But if it's 4D, then we can only assume that is it is inside the hyperplane. So we, if it is not, it's going to be equivalent to a projection. So it's not important anyway. But if uh, if we have a 4D point, we project it onto the plane, and once it is in the plane, we can express it as a 3D vector in this basis of three 4D vectors. So if that doesn't make sense to you, uh, I recommend that you go read up on something called change of basis in linear algebra. Uh, it's basically exactly what I said. The fact that you can express one vector in different ways, even with different numbers. So yeah, this is and this is the magic trick that will let us go from a 4D scene to a 3D scene. To, that we will then that we will then sorry give to our 3D engine to render. In our case, good old OpenGL. Yeah, so this is some trickery hacks magic. It's specific to the language, so we're not gonna expand on it. Uh, yeah, so I think we have all we need, except that I need to get rid of all the anchor. Anchor. Anchor? Yes. Instead of anchor. Oh, I'm just gonna fucking... I'm gonna replace add anchor.position. Uh, replace, I said, with nothing. Bam. And replace all the subs with nothing also. Just like that. Point. There. Alright, I don't think we would have anchor anywhere else. Uh, we do actually. Okay, anchor dot position is always zero. So sub v1 is gonna be just minus v1. v1 is what? Vector 4. Hmm. Okay. Again, uh, ask any questions if you do. I, I need them, basically. I'm not gonna talk through me debugging code like that. It's not interesting. So if you do have any questions, please. And if you don't, then come up with them.
do some have, get me something to work with here. Give me a bit. <laughs> yeah, unless you guys enjoy watching well adapting pretty abstract code to work with something you've no, not seen to begin with. So in that case, enjoy yourself. You're gonna have a lot of that. <laughs> Alright. I believe we're done in this geometry can for this fine point. Okay. Already oh, really. right. Alright, so intersector this is an instance yeah, it is an instance. Right. So main will have an intersector. Again, uh, I'm not looking for any use use ease of use or anything. I'm just basically this is very static. I'm just basically saying doing building like a little test case thing. The end goal of this is to try the, the geometry shader trick I was talking about. I was pretty worried uh online because I saw that many people were saying that geometry shaders are very fucking slow as compared compared to any to every every other stage of the rendering pipeline of OpenGL. So I was kinda worried. But then I'm saying it might be slow compared to doing nothing, but I don't know how slow it is compared to letting the CPU do the same thing. So we will and instantiate new objects like when doing the intersection, I'm I'm creating vectors left and right. So that's heavy on the garbage collector for once and it's gonna slow down everything. So if I have a geometry shader, I'm pretty sure it's only gonna make things faster. I can only assume. And but yeah, we'll see. So intersector. 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 Okay. So ideally uh if we have our forty bucks then all we need is well if if it works, if it does work. Then the intersector can be rotated, by the way. This is why I have a, a couple bases. Because the point is that if I rotate those bases, it's equivalent to the camera looking up, down, left, right, and anakada, <laughs> which are the left, the 4D equivalent of left and right, right? So if I do have that going on, that means that if I do have those, uh, those, the, these bases, I can just rotate these bases, apply the inverse rotation to the normal, and to the normal, or the same rotation, actually, I don't remember, yeah. Apply matrix 5, is what I mean by that. Um, if you remember, if you guys do 3D, 3D programming, then you will probably know that you could represent any affine 3D transformation using a 4 times 4 matrix. Well, in 4D it's no different. You can represent any 4D affine transformation with a 5x5 five five matrix. And that makes me think that I have to copy this class also. And that a thing. Matrix 5. Here we go. Wink. I have to get rid of the packages. There. Okay, so I have a couple rotation planes. Oh yeah. You guys didn't know. <laughs> I'm gonna expand on that later because that's gonna be very. It's gonna take a while for me to explain, so I'll, I'll take. I'll go back on that later. Later, dude. Okay, I have to get rid of all the packages. It's not 4D.math anymore. It's nothing. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Oh, uh, hacks. Hacks does it now. Uh, what else? Geometry, no box, that doesn't make sense. Intersector, no, okay. Alright, I think we are good to go, I guess, maybe. Alright, uh, uh, we're gonna keep our box, but now, our boxy box, dude bro, is gonna take an extra parameter, two extra parameters, in fact. It's gonna take W, which is already, ugh, alright, width. Height, depth, and dooth, and color still. Well, that's that's annoying because, yeah, I have two concurrent W usage. Doesn't matter. Third bar, dooth, 
Both is going to be the 4D length, length along the fourth dimension. Uh, so I'm going to need to do that. I don't want to use these dot things. Uh, yeah. Okay, and W. W equals that. Okay. Are you guys, you, you guys really have nothing to say. Wow. I'm doing 4D math over here. Uh, you're not gonna make me believe that everybody gets it. <laughs> or maybe the four people still here. Thank you, by the way. Appreciate it. Five people, hey. Maybe the five people here are actually postgraduate math students and understand everything I say instantly. In which case, boy, contact me. <laughs> I need help working on this thing. Well, I will need help later. Right now it's fine, but. I've been working out on. I've been working on some uh, 4D physics and 4D lighting equations. Oh boy, it doesn't look good. <laughs> it's going to be difficult. Okay, so what we want, what in fact we want, is to have this box over here create its geometry from the arrays that we gave it: face, cube faces, and vertices, or triangles and vertices. So what we do is that point. So this is gonna create. This is gonna fill the geometry with uh, 40 vertices for one and 3D tetrahedra in place of triangles because again the surface of a 4D object is a 3D object and 3D objects are best decomposed in triangle in a tetrahedra because we need the inside. We can we cannot just use triangles because we need the inside. Of the objects, so we have a tetrahedra. A tetrahedra we have tetrahedra instead. Okay, um, can I still use this shader? Solid GLA position equals that. Okay, position yeah, uniform. Okay, this doesn't make well. Well, okay, it does. Yeah, we can still use the shader. The point is that we are not going to give OpenGL those vertices anymore. But in fact, what we are going to give it is uh, the results of the intersection. Here. Like that. Bam! This array of vector 3 is going to be a couple of, um, of well, vector 3, vector 4, I mean. There are going to be a couple of intersection points, and those inter intersection points, uh, I have, or I already have written code to Around them into triangles that we can then pretty much just give OpenGL and he'll be happy with it. It will be happy with it. I mean, oh my god, did you just assume OpenGL's gender? No, uh, it's a mistake. I do that sometimes, it happens. <laughs> I didn't assume shit. So yeah, uh, X-ray to you with height, depth, depth. Am I using that correctly? Oh yeah, so because. Width, height, depth, depth. This is a 4D transformation, so we're gonna need a matrix 5. How's that? We're gonna need a matrix 5. We're gonna do that in the render call. No, we're gonna, not gonna, no, no. Well, uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, if you remember last time, we are using UMAT, like this. UMAT holds two things. For one, it holds the model matrix, it's a decorative of the model view matrix. For any of your old school OpenGL user days type deal over here, the point is that the model view matrix holds information about both the the object itself and then the camera. Here I'm I'm building it every frame. It's not ideal, but again, it's just a test test build in two steps. One, the model, so things like scaling for because we this geometry is for one times one times one cube. And the 4D extrusion will be for 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 cube. Hypercube, I mean. So I'm holding, I'm appending to the matrix a scale operation so that it has the correct dimensions. Uh, a couple rotation for fun, because why not? Uh, this is something that I have implemented in four dimensions, so we're gonna be able to do a 4D rotation, hype. Uh, and then just a translation to put it in place, because it, it takes place after everything. And then the projection is just a hard-coded matrix I've done, blah, 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 not interesting. Okay. If anybody's interested, 
in the projection matrix. You can just look at it very slowly and s and understand that it works. And that will be it. <laughs> I'm not going back on the projection matrix. You can read about it online, everywhere, on any OpenJet store that you want. So yeah, not like this. Alright, we have a problem though, is that we need two matrix passes, because one, the model matrix has to be applied to the 4D object. But the projection matrix has to be applied to the 3D slice of the 4D object. So we, in the middle here, intersection. Bam! Intersect them tetras. Akuna my tetras. <laughs> Sounds oddly familiar. Okay, I'm gonna hang on. Just do one more stream advocating. Bam! All right, just a moment. Okay. All right, back to that. So yeah, this is where we intersect them tetras using the intersector like this. So we don't. I'm not gonna do the fucking normal vectors. Get out of here. Don't care about normal vectors. Get out of here. Oot. Get oot. There. All right. Okay, so we have all we need. Uh, we have our 4D geometry. We have our shader program. We have our matrices, which in fact is gonna only contain the projection matrix, but it doesn't need to know that. Uh, we have a buffer, bind buffer, buffer data. This is not good anymore. So gel buffer, yes. Uh, this, no. Bind buffer, buffer data, nope. Nope, nope, nope. Uh, bind with, yeah. Gel vector cut pointer, we're gonna need to keep that for later. So, we take that, put it in the render pole, after we have intersected them tetras. Why? Because here, if I, if I kept it here, it would have copied to the OpenGL buffer these vertices, which are just a 3D box. Boring. Here we are here for the sweet, sweet 4D. So, what I'm gonna put in this buffer will come from the intersection of the tetrahedra. So we get, we'll keep that for later. Okay, so we don't need to trace any more things. Oops. Okay, dude. Alright. Just creating a couple of dudes, bro. This uniform location will use gel buffer. Alright. Sounds about right. Then, the fun thing, the fun part starts. So, we use the shader, sounds good. Bind buffer, okay, we have to fill this buffer because it's not filled yet. Also, we, we could just build the matrix right now. We just do that. We'll just do that. So, you, Matt, will be... <laughs> me, Matt, <laughs> I'm Matt. I'm funny also. Alright, so this matrix will contain the scale. So, it's gonna be a matrix 5. Boink. Have I implemented all those calls? I do not remember. Do I have... I don't have append anything. I do have make scale though, I believe. Post multiply. Well, I could just... Oh, scale, there it is. Scale. It's in place, but also re -entrant. I like my functions to be re -entrant. That way I can do things like... Like this. Umat.scale. Bam. Okay, do I rotate first and scale then? No, I scale first and rotate then. Okay, so scale first. New matrix 5, I believe, is just gonna fill it with uh, identity. Or doesn't it? This can new vector. No, what? Ah, oh, that's boring. That's not good. Do I, don't I have? Oh, point identity. Okay. And it oh, it's reentrant. Oh, guys. Oh, and that cool. I can just do that. And not not delete, but point. All right. It returns itself. All right. Always, always. I can't stress stress this enough. When you do math APIs, please, 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 always have reentrant functions because I don't want to have to do fucking one line per operation I do on my matrix. I want to be able to streamline everything. In fact, I could just do that. 
bam. Geometrics 5, bam, set to identity and then scale. Alright, so I want to be able to do that. It may be super fucking unreadable and shit. I don't care. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care what you say. I want, I want my sweet, sweet re-entrance. I find it very important. Um, what was it? Uh, 3.js that I was using for the demo uh, did not have re-entrance math. And you have lines upon lines of math that I like. One operation per line It's super boring. takes a while to write and to read. Anyway, end of ranting. So yeah, UMath. UMath contains identity. So for now it contains the scale. Then we want to add a little, a good old uh, rotation to the mix afterwards. Uh, okay, new matrix. Five. Okay, don't I have static functions to make rotations? I don't remember. Make rotation, multiply, negate, post multiply, scale, set to string, translate, translate vec, translate minus vec, transpose, transpose. No. Okay, I don't. I'm gonna have to do another matrix. Look what I have to do. Oh, no. Dot make rotation. Make rotation. Um, make rotation. It takes a rotation for D. Uh, I'm gonna do an interesting plane. Well, okay. Send in chat which plane you want the, the box to rotate over. X, Y is the equivalent of the 3D Z axis. If uh, if the box rotates over x, x y, it's gonna look like it rotates around the z axis, z axis. X z x z is the y axis. X w now you're fucked because it's it doesn't correspond to an axis. It's just the x w plane. Y z is the x axis. Y w z w those are for the only premium packages that you can buy in the 4D DLC. <laughs> Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Okay. So yeah, you can just like shoot in the chat which rotation you want to happen on your 4D box. It's gonna be chat design box. Alright. In the meantime, I'm just gonna blank. It's gonna be blank there. Uh and then what's it look like again? Make rotation. Uh theta. Okay. Uh, well, good old timer. Uh, that's in radians, isn't it? Angle, map cost theta. Yeah, it's in radians. Okay. Stamp. Uh, uh, that's seconds, so I'll just keep it. Make rotation. Okay. So we're gonna have a little rotation matrix. And multiply that by UMAT. It's UMAT. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a child. I'm a child. Okay. So it has it's got our rotation. What else did we add to it? The translation. Okay. So umad.translate, I believe is how it works. Translate adds to itself. Okay. And it gives just like that. Okay, cool. Translate X, Y, Z, W. So this is the 4D equivalent of the 3D we did last time. Strictly equivalent. Does the same thing. As you can see here. Rot vector. Bam. Like this. Rotation. Well, I, I removed the scale, but that's fine. Scale, rotation, uh, translation. Is all here. Scale, rotation, translation. It just got an extra coordinate. Is all. No big deal. Alright. So this is the model matrix. Then we're gonna have to multiply every vertex of our uh, 4D geometry by that matrix. 4D geometry is here. And yeah, we are going to intersect every tetrahedron by uh, multiplying every vertex of the tetrahedron by this matrix that we just calculated. It's gonna give basically a rotated, scaled, translated tetrahedron. And we are gonna feed it to the intersector to cut it in pieces, and that's gonna give us a couple points. And then, based on how many points it gives us back, it's gonna be either a triangle, a quad, or a tetrahedron. 
and then we'll build triangles that we're gonna give to the OpenGL buffer. And we're gonna draw it just like that. Easy enough. However, thing to take into consideration, uh, Uniform Matrix 4 is gonna hold uh, PMAT. PMAT is this. And instead of umat.append pmat, we're just gonna instead uh, expose pmat. Wink. Because all the actual rotation of the object will have happened before we cut the tetrahedron anyway. So we don't need to rotate it again. However, we still need to project it onto the screen at one point. And this one point is when the, th the 4D to 3D projection will have taken place. It will be done. So we just do that because it's now it's time. Now it's time. Okay. So we intersect them tetras now. So how that works is we loop through all the cells for C in cells. Easy enough. Hashtag fucking one letter variables carry. <laughs> Present. So for every cell, which I realize is not ideal because I don't have a cell class. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go through more boring fucking code copying shit stuff. Cell four. I'm gonna copy that. Is text normal? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Just gonna use as a container. There you go. So I'm gonna need a class that holds this because the, then the arrays are much more enjoyable to work with. Alright, so we're gonna use vector 2. What? Vector 2? Texture coordinates. <laughs> Ain't nobody got time for that. Get out of here. Textured face. That, even, that doesn't even work in the old version. No more vector to the tetrahedron. Oh yeah. Uh, we're gonna discuss that later. Later, dude. Later, bro. Basically, you can store the, uh, vector vector four, the class that I wrote for the four dimensional vectors. They have a four D cross product that can be defined recursively using the three D cross product, but we're not using it for now. So we're gonna put that on the side. Also, now in my four D geometry, I have to use four D. Faces, 40 cells. Well, cell 4, as I call it. Geometry 40. And when dead. Okay. So instead of int, we're going to leave it to 4. Hey. 4. No, cell 4. And then instead of float, it's going to be vector 4. What, why did I not do that to begin with? Okay. Vector 3. And cell. Well, int is fine, I guess. Uh, v dot length period there and that stays the same. Okay, vertices vector four. So we're gonna. Oops. Okay, more boring shit. Yay! Shoot your questions. Shoot them at me. Shoot me with your best shot. Which mark? That's not. That's not like great. While I very quickly do more advocating streams. There you go. Okay. Back to n not actually interesting, but yet slightly okay, I guess, code. New vector 4, period. Okay. So then what we do is v.set, if I remember correctly. I think, I believe I have that function. Copy from. Not at all what I meant. Set, please. Function set, in fact. Yes, set 2. Cool. Set 2. Um, 4k in 0 0.1. No, no, no. No, 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 no. No. I sh sh no. Uh, v3 in v3d. That's shitty, but it works. Don't forget it. I don't care. V3.x, V3.y, V3.z, dot z. And then, minus do over 2. There. Much easier. Can you? Okay. And then vertices dot, oops, 
dot push v dot close just like that right um yeah sounds about right okay who right now is listening to anything I'm saying at all <laughs> express yourself in chat there is a chat it's meant for that uh, vertices that push oh yeah yeah literally the same thing Think plus b uh, for v3 in v3 again stop stop code please nobody's listening to anything I'm saying cool I dig it pretty good <laughs> okay that should work v3 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 blah 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 base in this vertices dot length okay all right so instead of all this garbage the all these garbanzo beans I'm gonna do soups says dot push new cell 4 with a c e d and so and such and such I could use regex but ugh. Oh, I don't wanna I don't wanna be that guy new set 4 again if for everybody who hasn't who doesn't know what's going on we are building 4D geometry from 3D geometry just by extruding it a little bit nothing too bad no geometry was harmed during the making of this program it was only slightly massaged into a direction you don't know hello can you increase the bit the font size oh yeah is this better? Tell me all about it. Oh, it looks better, right? Yeah, sorry about that. Better now. Okay, and then C, oops, C E F D. Alright, so this is just boring tetrahedron ordering. Basically, I take my triangles. Yes, I'd better. Cool, cool. Thanks for your activity. Thanks for showing me you exist. I appreciate it. <laughs> so yeah, basically take the triangles. They have three vertices. Duplicate those vertices with varying quote unquote 4D depths, which is called which are called dooth for reasons. Because I I have to call it something. And then the, that gives six vertices, which is a prism. And this prism can be deconstructed into three poly uh, tetrahedra, which I do here. And that's it. That's our cells and our geometry. Okay, back to the interesting part, which is actually drawing the box. All right, so four C in cells for every cell. Also, doesn't this take vector three? By the way, I believe it does. Ah, uh, golly, joy. Did I say interesting? I meant boring. More, <laughs> more of it. Alright, so I'm gonna do a trickery. No, nope. replace that. Okay. Hang on. Alright. Copy that. Tricks. In in this, replace that with that plus new vector three. In selection, match for word on well, no. Replace. BAM! Knowledge! And then in that same selection, I'm gonna copy that. Which is the new line, basically. Select everything. Yeah. And replace it. Replace this with closing parenthesis. A new line, also, at the end. Never mind. <laughs> Doesn't work. Alright, it's fine. There. Should be good. Better 3. Yeah. Nice, but what's, what is the purpose to have it in 4D? What the supplementary dimension do? Well, if you're not familiar with what we do here, we are actually working on a 4D engine, a four-dimensional engine. What that means is we add an extra special dimensions for shits and giggles, because that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, so we are trying to display a four-dimensional box. What this means is take a point, extrude it, I right, paint. Paint streams, let's go. Just for you, my dude. 
I'll be taking time off everybody's all the time. Everybody else's time. And then we're gonna draw. Yeah. Alright. So, at, at the beginning, you have a point. It's a dot. <coughs> there you go. It's, uh, it's zero dimensional. It doesn't have a dimension. So it's dot. <laughs> no worries. This is what the stream is for. And then you take this point. Extrude it along a new direction that you didn't know before. It's called. It's it's not called anything. It's just a direction. So now you have a line. Some formidable. Oh okay, yeah, you have your line. Then what you do is that's one dimension right here. So I like, oh hey, one dimension is pretty cool. Much many 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 more possibilities than zero dimensions. But can we do more? And the answer is as you know, yes, we can do more. We can do more in the form of two dimensions. You take this line before you took the point, extruded it. Now you take the line and extrude it. Take the line, extrude it, gives you something quite like this. I'm sure you know what that is. It's a good old square. Rectangle, actually, but we call it a square. It's good old square, bro. Good old square, bro, right here. All right. So that's two dimensions. Because you can go in two ways. Well, you can you can go in many ways, but it becomes a little bit more complicated because you say, "Oh, I can go in infinitely many ways now." But in fact, it's two-dimensional because the direction that you go in is always supported by a mixture of t two single directions. Basically, I didn't want to draw a circle. The direction that you go in is always supported by two directions. This one and this one. Those are the only two directions you need to know. Because then, yeah, then you have perspective. Well, it's not perspective, it's 3D. Perspective is one way of projecting 3D onto a 2D plane. So, those two directions are called the basis. Basically, every direction in the plane is a sum of those two with, vari with uh, varying degrees of like, amplitude. So this, for example, is the sum of this one and this one. Just like that. See? See how this direction is a sum of the two basis directions that I talked about? This is why it is called two-dimensional, because you can build every direction in the plane with only two, basically. And then, you say, okay, two dimensions is pretty cool, it already gets pretty crazy, but can we do more? And the answer is yes, we can do so much more if we just do something called extrusion again on the square this time. We extrude it in an extra direction that we have not discovered before. And because this is a plane, I'm drawing on a plane, it's a little bit weird. Because the plane is two dimensional, so you can't do 3D on it. However, our human brain is clever enough to be able to work out what those diagonal line mean, lines mean. So, fortunately for me, I don't have to explain to you what the third dimension is because we already live in it. And as such, everybody here knows what that is. So yeah, because of that, there you go. Cube! Bam! 3D! Technology! <laughs> Video games! Okay. So you have all the 3D points over here. And we've, so far, we only, we've, we have only done one thing, right? We've only taken our previous iteration of what was a point, then a line, then a square, then now a cube. And we just take it and shift it in a new direction that basically we did not know before. Because I guess it I guess it was here the whole time, but I just didn't see it. Type deal, maybe? I don't know. We just invented it. Okay, so this is the cube that we know, and this is not perspective. This is orthogonal projection, because you see that those are parallel, those are parallel. Everything that is parallel is re in real life is also parallel on the drawing. This is called ortho orthographic projection. Ortho means same, and graphic means same image. Basically, it looks the same, is what that means, because it stays parallel. If I wanted, I could have drawn a perspective cube, which have looked a little bit more like this. 
So this is this stays parallel there, but this doesn't. This doesn't stay parallel. It goes instead something like that. A little bit, tiny bit. Yeah, perspective. That's the perspective was we were talking about. It's ugly, but uh, you get the point. <laughs> okay, so yeah, and then we say, yo, dude, bro, we have only been adding extra dimensions like crazy, so why stop here? And why stop here? So, at this point, I'm going to do something weird. It doesn't make sense to us, because we are human and we see in 3D, but I'm going to take this cube, and I'm going to translate it. Shit, that's not right. But yeah, take this. Well. Take it better. Pound. Copy paste. <laughs> Translate it like that, and then link the edges. And it would be like, oh hey hey ho, I'm gonna stop you right there. That is not at all what you did up until now. And in fact, it is. I just took. I just what I just did is take a copy, translate it, add edges. Is all I've done up until this point. That's all I've done. Also, please, paint. You, you can do many things. Let me do that properly. Please. And this. Oh, damn it. Ah, <laughs> help! And this, what I'm doing, is called extrusion. Again, same thing. Literally the same thing. There's orthogonal. has near Farkley planes. Well, I, near and far clip planes are notions of 3D graphics. It doesn't apply in general mathematics, basically. So the difference between orthogonal and and uh, perspective is that perspective uh, orthogonal preserves uh, angles. It, well, it preserves um, relations between angles. So what is perpendicular stays perpendicular. Perspective, however, preserves what is called depth of field, and depth of field is the following principle: what is far away looks tiny, basically. Uh, for orthogonal projection, you have no way of knowing what is far and what is uh, near from a single picture. However, in perspective, you know something is far because it's tiny. All right, so this welcome. Uh, I present to you the 4D cube. It looks like shit, but that's because we don't know what 4D looks like. <laughs> so this is a 4D cube. I just invented an extra direction and took the 3D cube that we know and translated it along that direction. And you say, hey, I know that direction. It's like left and slightly up. But that's only the projection on, this, on the 2D screen of that direction, which is actually a crazy fourth dimension fucking space, math, linear algebra thing. And the way that this is interesting to us is because we as humans cannot represent it. However, good old computer bro over here, it, on, it doesn't care what things look like, it only cares about numbers. And luckily, it's much easier to describe 4D as points with four coordinates rather than drawing on MS Paint. So what I'm doing here, the point of this whole series of streams that I'm going to do, and I'm doing, this is the second installment, is I have, I want to build a four-dimensional graphics engine. Now, there are several obstacles to that, is what do 4D graphics look like? And the question is not to make them, to make the computer graphics look like real 4D graphics, because it doesn't make sense, right? The real question is, find out what 4D graphics look like thanks to the computer rendering them. So this is why I find it interesting. And and the whole point of it is that. So yeah, this is what we're doing. And we were in the middle of drawing. Holy fuck, I found an input cube. Yeah, well, it's not it's nothing new. Uh, 4D geometry is nothing new to the internet, of course. However, the picture that you have linked in chat over here is a projection. It's a projection because it's a 4D cube that rotates and we have flattened it in 3D. Flattened, 
quote unquote. The idea of being flattening something is basically projecting a shadow, right? This 4D object, it has a 3D shadow because it's a projection on what is called the hyperplane. The hyperplane is a, in, in dimension n, the hyperplane has dimension n minus 1. So in 3D, the hyperplane has dimension 2. It's the good old plane that we know. But in 4D, the dim hyperplane has dimension 3, which is our whole space. Our whole space where we live is the hyperplane of some 4D space. Is a hyperplane on some 4D space. So yeah, what I'm doing here is, I have, so yeah, back to the code, because we were about to see things happen here. It's getting interesting, damn it. Or at least I believe. Do you believe it's getting interesting? <laughs> Am I interesting yet? Plus? <laughs> okay. So, what we have going on is, we have cells. Cells are tetrahedra. Cells are the equivalent of uh, faces in 3D geometry. But here it's... 40 looks so psychedelic. It does. It really does. So in case you all didn't see that, uh, here is our good bro, our end goal. This is what we want in the end. Okay, it's coming on screen soon enough. I believe so. Yes. Okay. This is what we want. This is an old demo I've done. Well, it's not so old, but it's now it's old because I'm doing something else. So this, these are two 4D boxes rotating and uh, being displayed by a technique called hyperplane slicing. So the idea is that uh, every 4D object is decomposed into tetrahedra, 4D tetrahedra, and then the 4D tetrahedra are cut, sliced with a 3D space, and what is left is effectively a 3D scene. So we display this 3D scene, and this is what we get. This, this happy mess of 40 geometry just moving around and did what have what's happening here is those two boxes are just boxes it's just that it's 40 boxes that are rotating this is something i will talk about this is not a bug it, it is indeed liking a face this is a known thing it's it's planned it's no worries i'll explain it later because it's very complicated uh yeah so these boxes are rotating in 40 space and in 40 space we have because we have one more direction to go in, right? Four directions. Well, then we we can rotate in many more ways. In 3D, you can rotate in three ways: around the x-axis, around the y-axis, around the z-axis. In 4D, you can rotate not in four ways but six, because in fact, this blue cube is fucking my man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, I don't get it. It's just a rotation. What is so hard about it? Tell me. <laughs> Tell me what's so hard, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, it's just a rotation. It's a 4D rotation. And just like a 3D cube rotating through a 2D plane leaves a changing and weird cross-section, a 4D cube rotating through a 3D hyperplane just like that gives a weird fucking cross-section just like that. It's the same thing. I don't know, I'm not used to see these kind of transformations. Well, nobody is. It's four dimensions. Like, you, you're not very much confronted to four dimensions in your daily life. Like, not so much. <laughs> Unless, if that's the case, I want, can I have your life, please? <laughs> I want to have it. So yeah, this is a box that rotates in uh, three ways out of six possible, if I remember correctly. And this is basically our end goal. This is what we want to have. So back to writing code. I have not written code since I said I would. What? Luzon, can we do? Can we do? What? <laughs> okay. So cells. Cells are tetrahedra. What we do to tetrahedra is we fuck them up. No, no, no. We don't fuck them up. We extract the vertices of them and then we feed them to the intersector. The intersector is the 3D plane that will do, that will cut the tetrahedra. Uh, so, interesting thought. While I'm doing this, uh, it's important to, to say, to look, to, to watch and realize that all the tetrahedra are basically independent. So, the cutting of it, the cutting of them could theoretically be done, actually, uh, wait. The cutting of every tetrahedra could is embarrassingly parallel, which means that 
you can pretty much process every tetrahedra at the same time in a parallel fashion because nothing uses any the data of any other thing like except for actually feeding the results into an array so do, this could be done um, in a parallel fashion very easily is what's pretty cool so that's why I want to use a geometry shader in OpenGL to do that because geometry shader invocations are parallel as far as I know <laughs> Have anybody correct me on that? But uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And uh, so right now we are extruding the vertices and applying UMAT to them. UMAT, if you remember, is the five times five matrix that is the 4D transformation of the object. Can you use index buffers with 4D, or is it impossible? Well, index buffers are just basically um, a way to describe primitives. So when you are doing triangles, uh, you want the index buffers to tell you, okay, the triangles, OpenGL knows it's only three vertices, and it's asking you which vertice it is, which vertices it is. And you're telling it, well, it's those three. But then OpenGL doesn't know 4D, right? Or at least it doesn't know that it knows 4D. Hey, hey, wink, wink. Because it knows, it does. Like, as, as, as soon as you know linear algebra, you know 4D. You know n dimensions. Like, it's the same thing generalized. So, yes, you could, I mean, if I do get to have my method work, yes, I will use index buffers for 4D. Because I'll be using uh, a kind of cheat way to tell OpenGL to use tetrahedra. Is what I said before. It's uh, a primitive called lines adjacency, which uh, has the good idea of being four vertices, and it's actually better than that. It's four 4D vertices because of homogeneous coordinates. So if I do get to tell OpenGL to use those, I could abuse this system to use tetrahedra instead, and then in the geometry shader, the geometry shader would take line adjacency primitives. And the geometry shader would basically do the intersector operation like inside the shader and do all the, cha the, the change of bases, etc. And then it would output good old fashioned triangles. And OpenGL would be like, oh, well, the geometry shader gave me triangles. Well, that's great. I can do triangles. And so it will display the 3D scene with little to no overhead. So that's my idea. And for now, we are doing the CPU approach, just to have a framework that works. And then we'll see about comparing performance and things like that. So, yeah. Oops. Wrong file. So, yeah. Ideally, I would use index buffers to tell it which of the four vertices are part of the lines adjacency primitive, right? Okay, UMAT times that. Distance late. Okay, the camera is always at 0000 for ease of implementation purposes, so we have no origin. Okay, the vertices are transformed in 4D space. Now we feed it to the intersector like that. Intersect tetra, this is the time. Via. So R will be an array of floats, and it will be uh, oops, uh, main dot intersect. A. Hey, intersector, I say. Intersect. Tetra, 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 okay, one, two, three, four, uh, yeah, I did call it that, right, intersector, yeah, okay, all right, so R is our array, okay, so at this point, we have intersected the, the tetrahedron with our 3D space, the 3D space is the place, let me remind you, where we live, Basically, it's the place where we live. So, the 3D space is the extent of everything that our eyes will be able to see in this scene. Because our eyes cannot perceive four dimensions. So, it only perceives three. So, these, no, the, the points in R are all in the 3D plane. But, they are still being expressed with 4D coordinates. So, what I want to do here, here is basically map uh, which a function which to a, to a vector v 
it does this change of basis main.insector.intersect etc. Well, I can do that. Okay. I, I'm gonna have to do another thing here. Um, this is gonna be temp and this is gonna be R, the actual result. This is because array temp would be an array of vector 4 and R would be an array of vector 3 because of the change of basis. So again, um, the 3D space lies in 4D space. So every point in the 3D space, which is in the 4D space, can be expressed either as a 4D vector or a 3D vector. This is called a change of basis. It's the same vector every time, but different ways of calling it that. If, if that makes any sense to anybody. <laughs> so we have this handy function here, switch base, that I presented a little bit ago. But that is just exactly what it says. Yeah. Just like that. Function v, which could return vector 3, point hey, vector 3 I say. There. Alright. So r contains, basically, we're done. Basically, well, we have to build the triangles now. Alright. So if r.length is at least 3, because the, the length could be 0. It could be 0, 1, or 2. It could be 0 if the tetrahedron is entirely outside of the, three, of the 3D space. It could be 1 if the tetrahedron is just like tipping one of its vertex into the 3D space. It could be 2 if the tetrahedron is it's just tipping its edge. And in all the three cases, we don't care, don't display anything. I really should study linear algebra more. <laughs> well... Like, 3D rendering, any sorts of computer graphics is purely linear algebra, so, and affine, affine algebra. So if you want to get to do things like that, then yes, you should, in fact. Okay. Uh, so if we have at least three points, as I've discussed before, it means that we have a viable triangle to this, to draw. So because of that, I'm gonna be a cheating bitch. And look at the old code I wrote for the previous demo, <laughs> which I know works, <laughs> and which is in camera. 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 Okay. So I'm cheating like a bitch. Don't mind me, as I. Intersect tetra offset is r dot vertices of length. Okay, I'm not adding. Oh well, I am adding to the same. Yeah. So because we are building also triangle. Uh, triangular indices, faces, you name it. So we're gonna have bar, uh, faces, not triangles, just that, equal new array of int. And then, uh, <coughs> vertice, well, vertex, vertices 3D is a new array of float because we are gonna feed it to OpenGL afterwards. Okay. So we are going to push triangles to the this triangles array, and we are going to push the result of those in vertices 3D array. So, as such, we will just, okay, we'll just have to take care of knowing the offset into triangles, because at for every tetrahedra, you could push from 0 to 4 triangles, and for, from, sorry, from 0 to 4 vertices, so we can't just say it's step times 3 or step times 4. We actually have to take care of keeping that, keeping up with that. So what we'll do is our vertex offset equals 0. Boink. And then what you do is vertex offset. Salut! Vertex offset. Non, je me suis levé à 5 heures. So uh, vertex offset takes basically the <laughs> hello by hello from friends. Hello friends. No, we. Oui. <laughs> 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 All right. Et si je dé, je me suis levé à 4 heures et demie, 5 heures pour pour streamer tôt à l'ère de l'Amérique parce que je suis malade. Et donc voilà, et vous êtes là. Vous. Oh mais t'es français, moi aussi là. <laughs> Virax, shout out to Virax, who is actually French, my dude. Sounds too much.
Non, un mec qui suit. Yes, I'm French. Hello. In case you didn't tell from the ugly accents and the lack of proper pronunciation. <laughs> je vais arrêter vers uh, 11h midi, je pense. Tu vas te coucher <laughs> Dur. Eh ben, bon courage. <laughs> Alright, sorry about that. For all your non-French speaking people, it doesn't matter. It's not, it's boring. Everyday life shit. Alright, back to that. So, Vertex has said we have to take care of how many vertices we push because our triangles would be. Your accent is pretty good actually. I, don't, I didn't know this until you spoke first. Oh, yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> I try my best. <laughs> okay, so oh, this is probably made easier for me by the ugly mic quality because I'm using like normal stupid headphones. Uh, ear earbuds, I mean. Alright, so vertex offset. Yeah, we have to take care of how many vertices are being put into uh, our array. That is because we need the triangles to reference them as offsets. Okay, vertices 3D equals vert yeah, vertices 3D dot concat R. There, we pushed our vertices. Pretty good. And then, basically, what we are doing is exactly that. Uh, we want to be able to tell if the intersection is a triangle, a quad, or a tetrahedron. tetrahedron. And this is done with a bunch of more ugly math! Oh boy, aren't you glad? And you are the gladdest. Oh yeah, we could just do that. Oh, we're gonna do that, in fact. We're, just, we're not gonna map. We're not gonna map. Nah. Well, I mean, it's, nah, we're not gonna map it. We're just gonna do a good old fucking array. Alright, so r dot length is not that. It's gonna be temp. Well, it it, it is r. So yeah. Alright, add the number of vertices and then push them for v in r. Vertices v. Yo. Oh no, because it's a float. Ah, right, it doesn't matter. We can still do it. Vertices 3D. No way. Var. Uh, v is a vector 4. So V3 equals main dot intersector dot switch base. So again, switch the thing and then push it. Easy enough. Vertices 3D dot push V3 dot X. YZ. There you go. Alright. And then that's not needed. Okay. For v in blah blah, r dot vertices dot push. Okay, we have an array of floats. That's why that's why we can just push the vector three like that. But it's equivalent. Uh, resulting intersections are triangles, quads, or tetrahedra. So we need to be able to tell. And to do so, well, first of all, we can notice that regardless of how many vertices there are, we always at least push one uh, triangle. As soon as we have at least three vertices active. So, as such, we just do that. We just do that. Triangles dot push new, well, n again, no, var t equals new, new nothing. What am I doing? Um, triangle dot push, yeah, 0, 1, 2. So, 0, oops. So, we need to push the vertex that we just calculated. And, uh, here comes the point of the vertex offset. Vertex offset is not actually being used. <laughs> not now. Vertex offset is updated afterwards. My bad. Because we need to be able to tell where what is the offset of the vertices that we just pushed to the array. So we use the previous iteration. My bad. Vertex offset plus zero for readability. And then one, two. So that's our first triangle. Hey, stop. That is our first triangle. 0, 1, 2. Uh, push direct. I did a function that makes sure that uh, the centroid, which is the approximated center of the 4D object, uh, make sure that the center, that the triangle is correctly oriented. Basically, I'm, I'm using the assumption for this function. Well, it's not, it's, it's not important. We are not doing that. Basically, I'm just gonna uh, draw all geometry 
double sided, it's gonna be easier. It's gonna be lots less trouble. Is what it's gonna be. Alright, so first triangle we know is there as soon as we have at least three vertices. But we could also have four. But no more. That's for sure. If we have four, then we don't know. We don't know. It could be either it could be either a quad or a tetrahedra. In order to know this, MS Paint, take the wheel. Uh, MS Paint, I have closed you, sorry. Alright, MS Paint, let's go. So, how do we know if four, four vertices describe a tetrahedra or a quad? Well, let's draw one of each. That's a quad. Oops. That's gonna be a quad. There. This right here is a quad. And this right here is oops is a tetrahedra in 3D. We're gonna have to imagine that it has depth to it, which should be easy enough. Wink there. That's a tetrahedra. You have see here one face here, two faces, three faces, four faces, the big face in front of it. So how do we tell? Because both have four vertices, but not quite the same, right? You could say, oh, they have more edges, but then our in, uh, our tetrahedron intersection only has, only gives points, not edges. So one very easy way to do that is checking if all four points are in the same 2D plane. As you can see, this quad right here, all four points are in the same 2D plane because the quad is flat. If I could have said, oh, but what if, like, what if, you know, what if I do that? Bam. Then the quad is not flat anymore. And I say, yeah, but then it's not a quad anymore. It's a tetrahedron. Bam. And so we can use it as one. So yeah, uh, the quad that we take, and this is, did, did, this goes back to what I said a lot earlier, which said that the intersection between two convex sets is a convex set. So that's how you know that your quad cannot be flat with like the thing bending, you know. Uh, I'm gonna I'm try, I'm gonna try and do that. Like this bends like that. If this were to bend like that in a 3D way that would make it so that the quad is not flat, then the quad is not convex anymore. So we know that, we know for a fact that we ca this cannot be the result of the intersection between a tetrahedron, which is convex, and our 3D space, which is also convex, because then the result has to be convex. So, if it's a quad, we know it's planar, which means it belongs to a single 2D plane. So we know it can't be bent in 3D like that. So this, that's very useful to know. So, in order to know, then, in turn, if it's a tetrahedra or a, th a thing like that, what we do is, uh, I don't remember. So we look at the code <laughs> that we know works, which is here. Okay, uh, so first we order vertices to have minimum successive angle difference. Oh yeah, this is to be sure. This part right here, it checks for the angle between uh, the points. It makes, sh it makes sure that when we go to from vertex 1 to vertex 2 to 3 to 4 in order, we have minimum successive angle difference. Why is that important? It's important because... MS Paint, please. It's important because it's to make sure that we don't get a quad. Because in the intersector, I don't check for the order in which I'm returning the intersections. So it's to make sure that we don't get a quad that is self-intersecting like that. This would be invalid because then we would push the triangles weirdly and they would not they would not work. It would draw like something like this in the end, which is kinda ugly and not what we want. So yeah, in order to make sure that everything is correct, we need to eventually swap those two vertices. If the angle was to be like super sharp, stupid, because if if the quad is like that, then when we travel along the vertices, it gives something like that. Vertex one, okay? Go there. Oh, the angle is like, is whatever, okay? Go to the next one. And then the angle is like stupidly big. 
because we are going in on this way, right? So because it's stupidly big, you know that it's actually way too big to be a correct quad. So what we do is swap, um, swap this one and this one, which becomes something much more enjoyable and much more usable overall, like this. So now we know we have the correct quad. This is why we need to check for minimal angle, minimal successive angle, as I like to call it. And this is done like that, basically. The angle is just a dot product. Uh, if you don't know, the angle between two, well, you can find the cosine of the angle between two vertices by doing a dot product between both and dividing by the norm of both. It's just, just easy like that. Quick little tip. Or just use angle between, which is a function that vector3 has and I didn't write, so yay. And if it were to be bigger, then swap the two. Like you can see here, v3 is offset plus two, v4 is offset plus three, and then swap, swap both, and just like that. Alright, so then when, when that's done, you push another triangle. Because you know that a quad and a tetrahedron both have at least two triangles. And then, only if a tetrahedron, only if it's a tetrahedra, you push, you push two more, because a tetrahedra, a tetrahedron has four triangle sides. So yeah, I'm just gonna fucking use that and adapt it, because there's no point in rewriting everything. Mm, boink. So this is kind of, actually I have a similar problem. I try to compute tangents and bitangents from vertices and textures, but yes, I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> tangents, uh, tangents by tangents. If you get the normal vector to, to your, uh, from vertices and textures, yeah. If you get the normal vector to your geometry, which is easy to calculate and interpolate, then you can, uh, using something which is called a uh, Graham Schmidt process, uh, like that, I believe. I'll, I'll let you look it up. The Graham Schmidt process is a way to build a orthogonal, uh, an orthonormal basis from a, from nothing, from a zero vector, basically. So if you have your normal vector, you can use this process to immediately find tangent and bitangent vector, just like that, from nothing else. So you're welcome. Here you go. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, you can use that, it works, it's fast, it's actually completely instantaneous, and uh, yeah, use that. So yeah, back to reordering vertices, that's what we like to do. So we just do that. Alright, so it's not called r.vertices anymore, it's just called vertices 3D. 3D I said. And then, and then, okay, we order that shit. Oops, hey, alright. Alright, v two v one is that vector three dot angle between. Blah 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 blah. This should work, except I do that. Vector vertices three D. Blah blah blah. V three cos v four. What? Why did I? Am I not? Oh yeah, because I'm not using it anymore. Okay, so I was wondering why I was not doing an equivalent thing with like v4 equals v3. But that's because I I never use v4 anymore. Well, I never use... Uh, wait, I do. What? Thanks a lot. I think I will unlock my shadow with this. Most welcome. I'm glad to help. Okay, I may... Whoop. Why is it working then? <laughs> Why is that working? Hmm. Chef tetrahedron v4 equals that. I do v3 equals v4, but not v4 equals v3. Yeah, I'm not certain as to why. Well, I mean, it works, right? So I'm, I'll just keep it. <laughs> Don't question it. Uh, push direct. Okay, this is just that. All of this. Push direct is just this. Now we don't have push direct. So it's 0, 2, 3. 0, 2, 3. Check for tetrahedron. So yeah, how do we check for tetrahedron? I was indeed 
uh, I was ending doing that. So we have our quad. Uh, so in to check for tetrahedron, we just have to make sure that it's not a quad because if it's not a quad by this junction, we know it's a tetrahedron. So paint, hello, back to you. Well, back. I don't think I've ever. Yeah, shit. Sorry. So yeah, quad. Um, what we do is make we try to find uh, three edges that are in the same plane. Because if it's a tetrahedron, then it doesn't exist. A tetrahedron does not have three edges in the same plane. Fact. So what we do simply is first we calculate the normal to uh, any triangular face. So we'll take this one, for example. Take this triangular face over here, like that. There, it's going to be better. Take this triangle face, calculate the normal vector. The normal vector is going to be something like that. Moink, well, a little bit better, please. Like that here, okay. Normal vector, and then what we do uh, in order to make sure. By the way, I need detergents to apply it to a normal map texture. Let me show you that. What? <laughs> You need the tangents to apply normal. Okay, I'm not too familiar with normal mapping, so I'll, I'll trust you on that. But it sounds weird. Okay, so using the, a good old regular cross product, take this edge, take this edge, cross product, bam, normal, normal vector. Then what you do is take an edge that does not, um, that is not part of this triangle. So we'll take this one in blue. Take this edge here, path, and then do a dot product between the normal vector and the edge. And now magic happens. Why? Because I've, if you remember correctly from a hour or so ago, I explained that um, in dimension n, a normal vector is orthogonal to a n minus one dimension object. I'll write it again. Not in blue. Alright, uh, in, in n dimensional, n dimensional space, a normal vector is orthogonal to a n minus 1 dimensional object, which in turn is called a hyperplane. Okay. So now, remember, we are back in 3D. This quad is not a 4D shape anymore. The 4D is over. The 4D is done. We just want to, to know how and why and, and, and when. And who? Simuleos. Hello, welcome. I'm good. I'm doing some geometry, in fact. <laughs> so, this quad, we want to know if it's a tetrahedron. If it isn't, then it has three coplanar edges. Coplanar means that th the three edges live in the same plane. What plane? Well, any plane that contains two edges. So, this is why. We take uh, the triangular face. Uh, we take two edges of the triangular face, use it to calculate a normal vector. As I, as the text to the right implies, this normal vector is orthogonal to a two-dimensional object, because n equals three. So this two-dimensional object is the plane that the quad lies on, if it is indeed a quad. So in order to check if it is indeed a quad, we need to check if all the edges lie on the plane. And in fact, we only need to check if one other edge Line lies on the plane because if it does, then the other does automatically. And to do so, we just perform a good old dot product between the normal and the edge. And because the normal is orthogonal or perpendicular, if you will, to the plane, then if the edge belongs to the plane, the result will be zero. So just like that, we have our answer n dot edge equals zero implies all 26, no, implies then that we have a quad. If it's the case, then we have a quad. If in, and then we are done, because if we look back at the code, if we have a quad, we are done, because we already pushed two triangles, one here and one here. So, n is the normal vector, a v2 minus v1 is the edge. And I think I could just 
use this. In fact, v2 minus v1, yeah, v2 v1. v2 v1, and then cross product with v3 minus v1. We can't use that because v3 might have changed in the meantime, so we just we have to recalculate it. Um, so yeah, this is what you do. And this is the normal that I showed, and this is the last edge that I also showed. Which makes me think that it's weird that it works, because I v3 equals v4, I don't see, I don't see me uh, changing v3 much, v4 much, so instead we're gonna do... Uh, blah, 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 what are we gonna do? v2, v1... Okay, we have to use v4, but then it doesn't... What? <laughs> Help! Why does it work? I see four dimensional vectors everywhere now. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> How so? If you see a four dimensional vector around you, it is probably it, it it's probably lost in our 3D space. You might want to point it to the nearest 4D projector that you see. <laughs> Be help help out a, f a fellow 4D vector in your area. Please donate. <laughs> So yeah, tetrahedron. Uh, well, pfft, I just believe that it works. I don't remember uh, exactly, but we no. I, I just play it safe. I just play it safe because v3, v6. Oh hey, easy there. And then v4 is v3 is temp. Stupid. Okay. We will just play it safe. All right. And then if it's a tetrahedron. Which means that the thing is not zero because the, the edges are not coplanar. So that means that we have an actual 3D shape, which again is tetrahedron. That's called matrices. <laughs> yeah. Well, a matrix is nothing but a family of vectors. And that's not a play on word either. It's actually a family of vectors. Okay, tetrahedron dot product blah 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 blah. If that is different, then tetrahedron push two extra triangles because tetrahedra have uh, three triangular faces. Four. Tetra is four. So zero, one, three. And the one, two, three. Let's do just that. Oink. Oops. One, two, three. Uh, hello? No, come back. Code, please come back. <laughs> Stop. Okay. Alright, and... There we go. Then we add the vertex offset. We add the the process verti vertices to the vertex offset, and then we have everything. Matrix. I need the tangents because my actual vertex normals are in model space, and the mapping of the texture has to be in tangent space. Oof, that sounds not ideal, not ideal at all. So I need. I think I need a transition matrix to convert from one space to another. Well. Adventure you gave me does that. Well, yeah, exactly. You have to build the transition matrix based on the the basis that you can have with the Graham Schmidt process. So you're welcome. <laughs> okay, so I think we are done. I think we are done. We have everything, and we could just we can just feed OpenGL with all the vertices. Stop. Okay, numpad. Vertices 3D. Vertex attribute pointer. GL a position. Yes, it has stride of zero, it's three floats. Yeah, okay. Bind the buffer, projection matrix, uniform, blah blah blah, draw elements. Oh, not cube faces, but triangles dot length. Unsigned int with triangles. Oops. Okay, let's try it out. I very much do not expect it to work because code never works first try. I'll be, f I'll be surprised if it compiles because we added so much code. Alright, terminal view. Let's go. That's not even the correct project. There. Lime test Nico. Alright. Unexpected... what? 102. Unexpected... oh yeah! Uh, nobody gave me a rotation. Nobody gave me a rotation. What? You guys don't want to see if through 4D rotation? Come on. Alright, last chance. Last chance romance. Before I pick one myself. Is that how you want to be? 
What do you want to see as a rotation? I have XY, my finest choice of 4D rotation. XY, which is equivalent to rotating around the Z, Z axis in 3D. XZ, which is equivalent to rotating around the Y axis in 3D. XW, which is not equivalent to anything in 3D. Uh, YZ, YZ, which is equivalent to rotating around X axis. IW, YW, I mean, and ZW. So pick one. The others will be lost. Sorry, I just kinda came in. No, no, no worries. To visualize 4D, you need to project it onto 3D, I assume. You're using spherical projections. I am not using projections. Um, projections I find boring. Because it's just flattening shit. And projection is useful when you already know what the source material looks like. Because you need to be able to extrapolate from what is basically a shadow, right? The flattened image. And in 4D, that doesn't work at all, because we don't know what 4D looks like, so we can't extrapolate. Instead, I'm using something that I call hyperplane slicing. The point of it is that the, three, the, the, the 4D scene, is, the 4D objects are decomposed into tetrahedra. Uh, and yes, tetrahedra are, 4D ob are 3D objects. But uh, much like 3D objects are described using their surface with triangles, uh, for the objects are described using their surface again, but the surface is 3D, and uh, use, you use tetrahedra instead. So tetrahedra, you slice them basically with the whole of 3D space. Basically, in 4D, the 3D space is a hyperplane, and the hyperplane behaves much like a plane does in 3D. So you could slice, you can slice things with it, and that's just what you do. You slice all the tetrahedra with your 3D space, and that in turn gives you either a triangle, a quad, or a tetrahedra, a tetrahedron. But those lie in your 3D space, because that's what an intersection is, right? So once that's done, you just build the triangles, which is what we did uh, over here. We, I am building triangle here. Basically, this is my tetrahedron in 4D. D1, V2, V3, V4. Those are 4D. Uh, vertices, then I feed them to my intersector, which is a helper class to handle the 3D slicing, the 4D slicing, I mean, uh, intersect, etc. It gives me a bunch of points, which are the intersection between the 3D space and the 4D tetrahedron. Then I do a change of basis to express those intersections in 3D, so this is actually a bit of 3. Um, that's fine, but you require four different moving objects to represent a 4D object. No, because uh, the slice is three-dimensional. So you can move the slice, in fact. The slice is a hyperplane. The hyperplane has an orientation in 4D. It has six angles, just like a plane described by, the, by its normal vector in 3D can be rotated around X, Y, Z. Uh, in 4D, you can rotate a plane, well, a vector, you can rotate a point around, well, on six quote-unquote directions, which are actually six planes. And when you rotate the tetrahedron using the model, this is, this is equivalent to the model matrix in the model view uh, OpenGL thing. And you don't require four different movie objects. To represent one for the object, it is not possible to represent an entire 4D object in a 3D space at once, of course. It's like saying, I want to draw a cube on a plane. You have to do projection, because you can't fit all the 3D information on a 2D support. And here's the same way. You have only a 3D support, so you can't fit if you, in for all the information pertaining to a 4D object. And because of that, some choose to project it, and thus lose some of the information, but I chose to slice it instead. And the information is not so much lost, because you can still rotate the slice to see all of the object. You, you just can't see it all at once, is what I'm saying. Okay, so I'm going to have to uh, use... Do not use call face for, for one. Yeah. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Simuleos. And sorry if I butcher your name also. I've been known to do that. Uh, for the record, I have, I do have a working stereographic projection uh, demo. 
uh, if you all are interested, I will post it. It is. It does use uh, um, here. It uses stereographic projection, and in my opinion, it's much less interesting. In fact, because again, you only see you you are only able to see one bit of it. Period. You will never be able to see more. However, in slicing, in hyperpatent slicing, what I think is much more interesting is that you can rotate the slice, and so you can look at the 4D objects under every possible angle in 4D, not just in 3D. So that's why I chose this method instead. And it's more natural, I think. If if 4D can be natural, if if that ever means anything, you know. <laughs> 4D is by, by nature not natural. Or some physicists say that it is. Uh, it's a theory. It is theorized that uh, electrons, for example, move in four dimensions at least. Move at least in four dimensions. So yeah, that could be a usage of my 4D engine. You could graph 4D electron movements. How about that? How about that? Okay, so... Once I am not a dummy, uh, and don't leave empty space in my rotations. Okay, so you guys just don't want to pick one then. Alright, so for the record, I am a computational physicist. Oh! Oh, so tell, tell us, how, wh wh can you think of any usage that a 4D, en a 4D graph engine would have in your work, for example? I, I doubt it. I doubt, it's, I, I doubt it would be useful. Like specifically in in your work, but maybe some things that you would want to try it for. Maybe if you could share that with us, if you can think of any, I, you don't have to, of course. I'm very much doing this for fun. I don't have an exterior motive or anything. <laughs> I just like inflicting myself pain over absurdly complicated math and and. Um, Computing uh, considerations. <laughs> okay, so I, I I'll pick I'll pick because you all you all are poopy faces and don't want to pick a 4D rotation. So I'm gonna choose XZ because I'm a boring ass, and I'm just gonna rotate around the Y axis. So let's do it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Box uh, line dot matter vector four should be float. Line that method but a four. What? Box that HX thirty seven. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Wait, why effect of where? When? New vector three, I meant. In my work there's not much. For the most part it's a mathematical concept. Inverse is best. Yeah. Yeah, that's also one interesting thing. Is that if you, if uh, here's the thing, if you keep the the intersector uh, parallel to the W axis, well, perpendicular to the W axis, I mean, then you could graph several instances of the same universe. Basically, you could treat W as time, x, y, z, W that you see here on the screen. It you could use W for time. And have basically time be frozen, and you would you would move through time by moving the intersector up and down along the W axis, and so it would literally be playing a video. <laughs> it would be a very, very expensive, not useful, and unnecessarily complicated way to play a video, a 3D video that is, and to do playback and. And going like backwards and stuff in a video that could also be applied for a game. Uh, if you do not, if you do not want to store inputs, you could store all of your 3D geometry and sample it uh, in time. And instead of storing it in an array, store it in a 4D space with W coordinates at the time. And then when you move your rendering slice, when you move the intersector, quote unquote, up and down on the W axis. You would indeed uh, go back and forth in time, so that's one usage. Uh, you could, yeah, you can model space time. Yeah, that's exactly the point. Well, it's not, but you could model 5D space time, <laughs> 4D space time. I mean, if that was even a thing, you could 
I mean, I have X, Y, Z, W. I could just add time in it, and then we have it for the space time. Okay, what am I doing? Uh, errors. Vector 4 should be float. I do not remember using the vector 4 in there. That's vector 3. Okay. Type not found, rotation 40. What? Or do I have to import it? Fine. Ah, uh, I import it. Matrix 5 dot rotation 40. Oops. Why it's matrix 5? Because it's defined in the file for matrix 5. So tell us, string theory uses 22. Um, different string theories use different amounts of dimensions. I know that, well, the one that I know of, well, widely speaking, use either 5, 7, no, 4, 11, 5, 7, ah, fuck, 4, 7, 11, or 26 dimensions is what I know about. Well, uh, is what I've heard of. I don't know anything about string theory, but yeah. Array vector four should be array lime dot math dot vector four. Should it? Should it now? R array vector four equals math. Oh yeah, I don't need uh, this one anymore. Or this one. Yeah, I do need this one actually. So yeah, uh, Simuleos, uh, tell us what you do in your work, if that's fine with you. Because I'm very much interested into math and physics as a hobby. I do want to be uh, a game developer professionally when I'm out of engineering school. But I have a heavy math and, um, and physics, ma uh, physics background. So I'm interested, if that's fine with you, of course. Can access private field E. Oh, an offset. Oh, I didn't call it offset. Oh, I'll call it offset. No, yes, no, yes, no. I just replace offset with vertex offset. Boink. Oh, yeah, wait, no. <laughs> Not like this. Offset with vertex offset. Whole word match case. Bam. There. Mucho better. I use GPU computing methods to solve for superfluid vertex positions. Damn. So maybe, I guess you... Yeah, <laughs> lol, awesome. And the GPU... Oops, yes. Also, I know you said that you are not doing a projection. You said taking slices. It's not a projection in the linear algebra sense of the term. Uh, you see, in linear algebra, a projection is defined as a linear application that is uh, involutive, which means that if you apply it twice, it doesn't change anything the second time. And yes, if you do it twice, the slicing, it changes nothing the second time. However, it is not linear. So it's not a projection, strictly speaking. However, it does behave like one, though. An, intersection, an, an, uh, an intersection is not linear. So, yeah. Alright. Compile this. Oh yeah, private field E. Well, make it not private. What do you want me to do? That's all caps. Uh, where is that in vector 4D? Vector 4D. Uh, that's public. There. Hmm. There. Let's see what it tells us. Float has no field subtract. That would be correct. Where do I do that? One four six. Wrong file. One four six. V two dot subtract subtract v one. Vertices two D is a float. Ah, I did not think about that. I'm ending off. Gotta get some stuff done. These guys. So the point is, no worries. You can. You are free to act as you please. This is a free stream. <laughs> Thanks for coming. I hope you liked your time here. And good luck with your stuff that you gotta get done. Oh yeah, uh, vertices 3D. Yeah, that's mm, that's a vector 3, all right. That's not a vector 3. That's floats. Those are floats. Shit. Those are floats. Uh, okay. What I do then is that. I'm a good one. 
Uh, that's annoying. Mildly. That's mildly annoying. That's shitty, even. I would say. <laughs> ah! Annoying. Okay, I'm gonna cheat and do a pop vertex function. On vertex offset. Uh, vertex is 3D. Pop the vertex offset uh, vertex from vertex vertex 3D array. How does that make you feel? And then pop vertex static. That'll be sure. what private ready. Up pop vertex e and oops and a array of anything. Is not gonna be a constraint. Well, no, it's float. I'm, what, am I, what am I talking about? It's a floater Rooney. No need for templates for the type parameters and all the fancy shit. Just pop basically return a vector three. That's that that rhymes. <laughs> How's that? Basically return a vector three. That is. Made up of all of those vector three for AI times three, AI times two plus one, and AI times three plus two. Easy enough. And that should do pop vertex. Yep. 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 Cool. Now what we do is uh, literally the same thing. The same thing. Let's go. Press one, two, yo, stop. Two and three. Point. We order vertices to have minimum successive and all difference. Okay, because we know that we have at least four. Cool. Stop. Not bad. All right. All right, that should do it. Uh, what? What? What else was it? Not enough arguments expected to do. Th oh yeah. Uh, in the main, when we create the box, a Rooney. Uh, extra dooth is gonna be zero because it's gonna be the cube. Right. So here's the thing: when we initialize the intersector, which is um, here, you see that the normal vector is along W. Basically, what this means is. The intersector is basically the canonical 3D space, which is like X, Y, Z that we know about, the correct, like, usual one. So, I'm gonna put the box in W equals zero, just so that the box is, oh, sorry, the box is in our space to begin with, so it's gonna be easier to, to visualize for us when you are looking at it. And then, uh, one, two, one, one. A dooth of one. Uh, box. Okay, what else? Nothing else. Compile. Vector of three should be float. Oh boy. Yes, 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 indeed. I'm gonna have to do push vertex now. Oh boy. Anti glad. Anti glad? What? No. <laughs> Stop that. Am I not glad? Yes, I am. Is what I meant. Uh, index A. Alright, vertex is what I'm pushing into array A with index I. That's gonna be a whole lot of no. A dot push. Well, not. I mean. Oh, yeah, it's not pushing. It's insert vertex. Because it's already here. So A of I times 3. Times 3, I said. Is V dot X. And etc. So one plus two. There you go. Mm -hmm. So like that. Uh, insert vertex. Is it? Yes. Insert vertex before into at the offset vertex offset is two into the array vertex is three D. There and. Uh, same old, same old. 
shit. Yo, stop. Okay. Uh, it's V4, it's V3 this time, into Veterans Press 3. There. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Are we done yet? Sir, I would love to be done. Compilator, bro. I mean, it's really my bad if I'm making mistakes. Ouch. Okay, it compiles but it crashes. Good talk. <laughs> what is, what's, what is, what is that? What's that all about? And now, let's play the trace trap. Let's play the trace trap. Uh, so, debugging tip, a good thing about hacks is that this trace function, which is basically the printf of hacks, it uh, immediately writes the line, when it's called, uh, the line where it came from. So you don't have to, you basically don't have to do anything, like here. It prints box.hx at line 96, which is indeed box.hx at line 96. So you, I just could write nothing. But it's easier to look at it. So I'm just gonna write A. So it's reaching the end of that. Is it? I'm gonna put fucking traces everywhere because I'm I'm a good programmer. Is what I do. Uh, I'm guessing it's somewhere in there. Of course, we have already seen Dupin addict func shader. Uh, yeah, sure. The 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 problem is, I do I have no idea how lighting works in 3D in 4D. <laughs> Because here's the thing to blow your mind, if you take a 3D cube and put it in 4D space, you can see all of it. You can see the entirety in the, of the cube. If you had 4D eyes, you would see the entirety of the cube, including its back and its sides. The only thing you would not see would be its inside, of course. So yeah, pretty mind-blowing thing for you. That would be indeed the case. So, because of that, lighting is a little bit weird. And I'm, I have not thought about it yet. Of course, I obviously do plan on working on that. I'm not gonna do PBS, physic based, uh, PBR, I mean, physic based rendering. Because it doesn't, in my opinion, it doesn't make sense in 4D to do that. Because it's like fucking, what? <laughs> lighting can be calculated in the fragment shader and it's per pixel, so it's okay. Or you think it's okay, but I mean, if it's a simple, like, if it's a simple model, like, uh, Lambert, or everything that matters is the distance, then yeah, it's fine. But if it's like something much more, okay, EFJ, so J, it's executing a bunch of times. Why didn't I put that here? Uh, if it's only a Lambert that uses, like, even Guru, it would be fine. Fong, I'm not so much, but if that's just that, in the vertex shader, the GL position is just a mat four. It's a vec. It's a vec four. But it, the point holds. Yeah. The the problem is that because the material is 4D, all the statistical approximation of them, like micro facets or anything like that, everything is wrong. <laughs> Ambient occlusion becomes much more difficult. Well, not more difficult, the same algorithm, but it becomes much more expensive because you have to, you have so many more directions to go in, right? So in order to be more accurate, you need more points. I implemented Fung yesterday. Wait, I give you my fragment. Yeah, but again, your lights are 3D and my lights are 4D and my light, period, it moves in much weirder directions. <laughs> So light can come from many more angles. Uh, so I don't, sh I don't know. I, I, I would love you to know, but I don't know. <laughs> okay, gel buffer data vertices 3D dot length times four because float th float 32, float 32 array not static dy dynamic. In fact, let's see. Yeah. Well, in, actually, you forgot m view inverse times that. Yeah, you forgot to. Mo oh, that's that's the vertex shader only. That's only the vertex shader. Yeah. Uh, struct directional light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the there goes the fragment. All right. 
dot blah 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 clamp dot normalize zero one yeah well mm, you don't have to clamp your direction your dot product at the end you don't have to clamp it you just have to keep it positive so just take the max between this and zero and you'll be fine anyway back to that it's crashing somewhere I'm not sure where because then if I was it would be done <laughs> stupid okay it's crashing fuck I closed the terminal never mind that have another one in jail there. you saw nothing okay so it's never Catching up with I. <laughs> also, uh, if you were to implement specular lighting, you would have to keep it. Well, I mean, no, that's stupid. You don't have to clamp it to one because you normalized both vectors already, so it can never be above one. That's why. That's why. That's the correct reason why you could just use max because it never, it can never be ab above one because you normalized it. You, you normalize both vectors. Anyway, jail band buffer. Okay, so I'm doing something wrong here. Jail vertex at three pointer, jail position, three jail float, false, zero stride, zero offset. Well, that very much all seems good. Oh! Of course. Of course. I did it the first time for the triangles, but not here. Oh well, shit. Line test Nico, please. Oh yeah! Look at this! Look at this box right now. It's working! And just like that, no, no, I noticed that if max between the value and 0 to, for example, catch fate and be inflated. Yeah. And look at this! We have our 40 bucks! Uh, do we have our 40 bucks? Can you see the 40 bucks? No. Why? 40 bucks, hello. 40.exe. Oh, yeah, my bad. Spoilers, it works. <laughs> there it is. Okay, you have it now. 40 bucks. Yeah, it's a 40 bucks. It looks very much like a 3D box. But, if I stop it, change the rotation. Haha, box, where are you? Rotation, matrix. Hello, yes, here. If I do, for example, what do we do? Let's do XW. Let's do XW. Then, it does some weird shit. And you're not gonna <laughs> see it because, uh, because, yeah, there is no depth, because it's a solid material, so I'm gonna do that real quick. And I can remove all the traces because I'm I'm good. I'm so good right now. Oh, dude! Like, wow! I did a box. Like, whew. hot. <laughs> it's pretty hot. How many of you guys are extremely underwhelmed by the fact that a 40 box is literally just looks like a 3D box? Raise your hand if you are underwhelmed. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, uh, XW rotation. What does it mean? It means that, okay, I was, I, I did say I was going to expand on the whole rotation thing because it needs to, it's not trivial by any means. So because of that, hello paint. Hello paint, welcome back. Start up, start over, All right. So, uh, you have to stop thinking about rotations like being around an axis because that's not the case. It's the case only in 3D. Why, you ask? Because if you remember the thing I've said 10,000 times already, a normal vector is orthogonal to an n minus 1 object, dimensional object. That's not what I wanted. Never mind. Boink. There. That's your normal vector. Well, not really. Ah, uh, it's not really, but we'll say it is. The vector his is your normal vector. The plane here is the orthogonal of that normal vector. In the same way that the normal vector is the orthogonal of the plane, you can say it 
the other way and say that the plane is the orthogonal of the number of vectors. Indeed, every vector in the plane is orthogonal to the normal vector, so both ways work. So you say, when I do a rotation around this axis, you say, I rotate like that, something like this, right? And you say, oh, well, to rotate around this axis means that everything that is not on this axis moves, and everything that is on this axis does not move. That's what that means. However, this is only correct in 3D, because in 3D, uh, when you say the orthogonal of a plane is a normal vector, that's only true in 3D. Because again, uh, this is Grassmann's theorem, uh, the orthogonal, well, this is a consequence of Grassmann's theorem. The orthogonal of, uh, well, in n dim space, in n dimensional space, the orthogonal of a p dimensional object has dimension n minus p. That's a consequence of something called Grassmann's theorem, which is a theorem in linear algebra. What this means is, in three dimensional space, the orthogonal of a two dimensional object, here plane, has dimension 3 minus 2 is 1. So, vector. However, in four dimensional space, the orthogonal of a two dimensional object, a plane, has dimension 4 minus 2, which is 2. So, the orthogonal of a plane in four dimensional space is another plane, not a vector. And in fact, if you think about it, our rotation is not around an axis, but onto a plane. It's like everything that is supported by the plane describes the movement. And everything that is in the origin of the plane does not move. That's what it means. It's a matter of projection. If I have, uh, for example, this point here, you could say it rotates around this axis, and then it kind of does a thing where it does like kind of like that. Yeah, point point, like this. It rotates, but then it becomes this point over here after its rotation, right? But what if instead of doing that, I told you that it's not the point, but the coordinates of the point that are supported by the plane that rotates. The way that would work is you have the normal vectors of the plane, you project you project the point on the normal vector and subtract it. What that gives is first you you can project it like so. Beam 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 like so you project it. That gives you this point. It gives you a vector in fact. It gives you this vector. Oops. Line this. Okay. It gives you this vector right here. That's the projection of the point on the normal. You take this vector and subtract it from this point. What you get is this point over here on the plane. Kind of like here, sort of. La please. Circle. Yes. You get this point, kind of, sort of. You see that it is on the plane, but then, because of the rotation, the plane turns. So this point over here becomes this point over here, kind of, sort of, because it rotates around the origin, right? So it becomes this point, like that. Here, then, point, and we're going to make that blue, because I like it. Blue point. Okay, so to sum it up, red, uh, black dot, we want to rotate it, quote unquote, around the normal. This is not correct, because it, well, it, it is correct in 3D. But we want to try and make everything that is correct in all dimensions. So we'll, instead of saying we rotate it around the axis, we say we rotate it onto the plane, which is orthogonal to the, to the normal. So what we do is, take the orthogonal, of the plane. It's this normal right here. We project the dot onto the orthogonal. It gives this red vector here. This red vector. Then we take the point and subtract the red vector from it to get this red point over here. 
you see that this red point is on the plane. Basically, what we've done is called orthonormal projection. It's called orthonormal because we take the orthogonal part of the point and we subtract it. So we are left with only the ortho orthonormal. We are left with only the part that is on the plane. Basically, we subtracted everything that wasn't on the plane, so we are left with something that is on the plane. And then, the plane rotates, and the plane brings the red point with it into the blue point over here. And then we take what we have subtracted and add it back again. And if you don't count all the miscalculations I've done and the approximation that I've done while drawing, you get the same point. Impressive. Wow, mathematics. And indeed, you get the same point because in 3D, those are equivalent. Those are the same operations that we just did. This one and the long complicated one are the same thing. Now, why do we care? Well, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you that I have a plane. I have a plane. And it's normal. It's, a, it's just just a plane. Good old plane. We are in two dimensions. And now I say I want to rotate this point right here. I want to rotate it around that point. How do I do that? Does anybody know how I do that? <laughs> you could say, oh, I just take the z-axis that goes from this red point towards me and then rotate. But no, that doesn't work because what is the z-axis? It doesn't exist. We are in a plane. It's two dimensions. There's no three dimension. What's that? What three dimension? <laughs> what what are you what are you nuts? What? Two dimensions? No. So yeah, we are <coughs> we only have two dimensions. And the orthogonal of a plane in two dimensions, according to Grassmann's theorem, in two dimensional space, the orthogonal of a two dimensional object has dimension two minus two. Zero. Uh wait, that's a point? Yes, it's a point. The orthogonal of a plane is the origin. Zero. It is the only point that is orthogonal to everything in the plane because the dot product is zero. <laughs> the dot product between anything and zero is zero. So it's the only point that is valid. But then it doesn't help us much for our rotation. And indeed, this is where it's very important to say that a rotation is not, uh, is not born by a, an axis but by a plane. Because in 2D, there are two axes, right? There are like this one and this one. X and Y, easy. But none, you can, you cannot rotate around any of them without exiting the plane into a third dimension, which, let me remind you, does not exist because we are in 2D. <laughs> so indeed, it, it must seem like rotating around an axis is inherently wrong. Or at least calling it that is wrong. And it just turns out that coincidentally it works in 3D. Because a plane and a vector just happen to be the orthogonal of one another. So it's equivalent. But it's only true in 3D, only true in 3D. So instead what we say is that the plane itself rotates. The plane itself rotates in such a way that the only point that is left unchanged is the red one over here. The plane itself rotates in such a way that the red point itself is the only one that does not move. So what happens is the red dot does move and it rotates like this. Bam, shit, that's a line, that's not a curve. Here. It rotates like that. Boink, boinky, boinky. That's kind of an ugly rotation, but you know what I mean. And good old red point, uh, black point becomes green point over here. And the red point has not changed, and the red point is the only one that hasn't changed. So this, I, uh, this is, I hope you understand that it's, it's extremely important to understand rotations as taking place on a plane and not around an axis. Because in four dimensions, where the real deal is, in four dimensions where the cool kids go at recess, uh, you can't rotate around an axis. It doesn't have 
it doesn't make any sense to say I rotate around an axis because when you do that a rotation there is an entire plane a 2D plane that does not move because if you say the axis of rotation is the axis of made up by every point that does not move then it's not true anymore because in 4D there is an entire plane that does not move so you could call it plane of rotation then it becomes ambiguous because when you say plane of rotation do you mean the plane that moves or the plane that doesn't move and so by convention we say that the plane that moves is called the plane of rotation and the plane that does not move is called the plane of the fixed plane yeah fixed plane and in 5D when you do a rotation there is still a plane of rotation but there is a fixed space because it's an entire 3D space that does not move that is not affected by the rotation <laughs> And in 6D, it's an entire 4D space that is unaffected, and so on and so on. A rotation is only a 2D thing that moves. And in fact, you could, you could show with very complicated linear algebra that I myself forgot how to do, but I've done it before. You can show that any rotation, if you take a matrix, right? Matrix, wink. If you take a matrix of rotation, like a matrix that does a rotation in n dimensions, you can actually show that this matrix is only made with tiny 2 times 2 matrix on the diagonal. So in fact, every rotation is a 2D operation. Well, that's it. That's enough. And that's how you know. That's how you know that rotations are to be born by planes is because any rotation in any dimensional space is actually a succession of 2D rotations one after the other. It doesn't have to be like the identity matrix which does nothing is a rotation. It's a rotation by zero degrees. Also a symmetry which is exactly what you think a symmetry around the point is a rotation. It's a rotation by 180 degrees. So you can use those as well. And any rotation matrix in any dimension on top of that has this face, basically. It has exactly this face. Also triangle, I would love if you could go upside down. You cannot go upside down. Shit, okay. Um, triangle, please. Can I do control triangle? Shift triangle? No. Rip. Well, doesn't matter. Anyway, the point is, a uh, rotation matrix has this face. The triangle, upper triangle is zero, lower triangle is zero, and all of this are two times two rotation matrix. Around whichever axis you want it to be. And in a certain basis, right? It doesn't have to be, it's not always in that form. You could have rotation matrix that looks like weird shit, but for every rotation matrix, there exists a basis in which your rotation matrix is actually a bunch of 2 times 2 rotation matrix matrices put together on the diagonal of a big n times n rotation matrix. And so that's exactly how this works. This is why my rotation for the enum that, I'm, that I have here, like this, this is why my rotation for the enum it designates rotations by planes because that's exactly what it is. And so because of that you can construct any and all 4D rotations simply by multiplying matrices together. That's why this works as well in 3D. In 3D every rotation is around a plane again. It, when you say I rotate around the x axis what happens is the rotation about the yz plan, plane, plane, plan, plane, plane, plane. And when you say I rotate around the y axis, what happens is actually a rotation on the xz plane. And then you can see a pattern here. I was speaking about normal vectors before, and yes, the y axis is the normal vector of the xz plane because it's the only 3D axis that doesn't show up in it. So the z axis is perpendicular to the x, y, etc, etc. But then, here comes this thing, x, w. 
uh, there is neither y or z in them. So what that means? Well, what that means is simply that the y and z plane are the fixed plane of the rotation. So when you apply uh, x and y rotation, which we are doing, by the way, here, x and y, if you look closely at the at the build, you will notice that the y neither the y or z coordinates of the point change at all. It's only x and some weird contraption thing going on. Uh, you will you should see it yeah in a moment. Yeah. So the the weird contraption thing going on is actually the w coordinate changing. But as the w coordinate changes, the three D slice that you are that we are taking it picks up different parts of the object because W is changing. So because W is changing, you get weird, like, pulsating things, although it's only just a rotation. There's nothing more going on than a rotation. If you think the geometry is getting, um, is getting disformed and uh, changed, that's, you're being tricked by the power of four dimensions. This cube, this is a cube, I mean, it's not a cube, it's a box, but this 40 box is never uh, broken or squashed or uh, expanded or anything. It's just rotating in 4D. And because we are taking a 3D slice, it's, it looks like that. Now, as was said before, we could have been taking a projection. And what we would have seen would be something like uh, Virax has posted a while ago. If you, when he said, I found a hypercube. You would have seen this. If we had taken um, a projection of the XW rotation, you would have seen this. This uh, what I posted in chat. This is uh, XW rotation as seen when you flatten the result of the rotation into 3D space. It looks much cooler than just a box weirdly changing. But in my opinion, is much less accurate and much less interesting, in fact. So that's my two cents. <laughs> so we have successfully done a 40 box. How about that? We did a 40 box. It's 40, it's a box. So now I did not export the normal vectors, so we can't actually do um uh, lighting effect like I wanted, but I'll do that off screen. I'm gonna end the stream here. Uh, if anybody has any question, now is the time because I'm gonna go. I need to go! <laughs> so yeah, uh, I want to clear that up. Uh, I didn't have a schedule when I started streaming on Monday, so now I'm going to try. This is new for me. I'm going to try and stick to the schedule. The schedule is going to be, I'm going to stream on Monday for uh, the European 2 p.m., uh, 10 p.m., I mean. So in Europe, in France, it's going to be two, uh, 10 p.m., so 10 p.m. GMT minus 1. And on Thursday, I'm going to stream on uh, the two American 2 p.m., 10 p.m., I mean. So it's going to be 4 a.m. Europe or 5 a.m. 5 a.m. France, so I'm gonna try like I did. I like I did not do today. <laughs> I tried, but I couldn't make it. So yeah, uh, Monday is gonna be Europe, and uh, Thursday morning slash Wednesday evening for America is gonna be American stream. So yeah, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Virex. I I am glad that you find it interesting. Uh, yeah, we have our 40 box, and next time, uh, I'll do lighting real quick before next stream, and on the next stream, we will attempt to do the, it, the Tesseract, uh, interse intersection, the whole intersector deal. I'm gonna try and put everything in a geometry shader, so that everything is automated. The, C the CPU is completely Completely does nothing anymore, <laughs> and uh, we're gonna see how that goes. I'm gonna have to experiment with geometry shaders in the meantime. That should be uh, that should be no big deal. Sorry about that. Next time, blow up the bow. <laughs> uh, 
So yeah, thank you everybody for coming. That'll be it for me. We blow up the box. Oh, the box. The bow. Like what? I like 4D archery now. Let's go. <laughs> 4 the archery. I mean, it would be super fucking weird. You would have to find the target first <laughs> by looking around in 4D. <laughs> that wouldn't be ideal at all. But after that, it's pretty much finished. Yeah. Okay, so next time, uh, Lambert lighting. Little, like, not much. Just uh, taking account of the camera position in 3D, not 4D, because for now I am rendering in a 3D. Inherently 3D pipeline. The shader acts on 3D geometry. I'm giving OpenGL 3D geometry because the 4D has been adjusted before the draw call. Uh, yeah, next next time we will we will move forward on making that a 4D pipeline. As in, uh, I am actually issuing 4D vertices to OpenGL, and uh, the geometry shader will take care. Uh, of making that 3D, so we will see how that goes. In the meantime, thank thank you everybody for coming. If you don't have any questions, I'll wrap it up. Uh, if you have any feedback, uh, find the post on Reddit. If you did not come from Reddit, uh, where the hell did you come from? Also, thanks. <laughs> but yeah, I have a post on Reddit. Uh, you can comment on that. It's called. Uh, American 4D stream, come hang out and build 4D boxes. You can comment on that, leave me your feedback if you wish. Because I, I, I'll, I can use it. I'm very much, um, a noob. And, uh, for once, the video is backed up, so I have a VOD, uh, coming up, coming up. I come from Twitch. Well, hello, person that comes from Twitch and also speaks French. That makes two of us. <laughs> Alright, so the VOD is up. I'm gonna, I've been requested to upload it on YouTube. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna ask Twitch to do that in a while. Until then, thanks for coming and see you around. Bye bye.